Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer. And today we're going to be talking about Judy Bloom's book, Forever. This is one of the books from Utah's Remove from Schools list, where there were 13 books that were chosen for removal by Utah school officials for breaking the law about content in school libraries. And for a refresher on what that law was, there was a questionnaire that went out to the school district, and the questionnaire contained three options. One contains a depiction or description of human genitals in a state of sexual stimulation or arousal. Two contains a description or depiction of the act of human masturbation, sexual intercourse or sodomy, and or three contains a depiction or description of fondling and or erotic touching of human genitals or the pubic region. So keep that in mind as we go through of if it falls into having any of these elements, then a teacher or school official was to mark it on the questionnaire. And if three or more or school officials from three different districts marked it on this questionnaire, then it was removed statewide. Not only are we discussing it for that reason, but also I think it's time for this book to retire, okay? It's... <laughs> It was written by a 37-year-old fantasizing about 17-year-olds having sex and is now being defended by an 86-year-old. I think school has changed a bit. Life has changed a bit since 50 years ago. But uh, let me know what you think as we go through the story, if you think that this is still relevant or if like people can choose to have different things. And that's not to say this book shouldn't exist. That's not to say you can't buy this book or get this book elsewhere. The removal is specifically from public schools in Utah. Albeit, I felt personally hate-crimed by this book. I think it's just a really poorly written book. To me, it reads like the author did not care about their own book, and instead it's an opportunity to politicize, to sell a book politically, and so put minimum effort in there to, like, throw whatever this garbage is because there are no characters but we're gonna get into that here in a second like it should be offensive that the main character in this book is the only book that has zero character zero personality zero motivation period except for having sex with somebody and when she can't have sex with the one guy that she's with she then finds a different guy to fantasize about and then have sex with him instead so like I want to have a conversation about that, but we're going to get into it. Before we get started, though, number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. The number one way to be featured is through Lemoy, the monthly prompt writing contest, where I give you a prompt, you write a short story using that prompt, and on the first Monday video of the month, we bask in the creativity of some of those prompts. It really depends. <laughs> Try to follow the prompt suggestion. If you don't follow the prompt suggestion, your likelihood of being featured is less. But also, a limited time, guys. I am a one-man show, so I can't always read all of them. Anyway, the second way to be featured is if you are an indie author and to a book out or a book that is coming out, if you submit your first chapter and your cover to the Fresh Meat feature, it'll be read here on the channels who hopefully help more readers find your work. I did just recently get Tindieth, which was featured last week on Monday. And um, after finishing the book that I am currently reading, which does not have any relevance to anything, <laughs> I should have waited like four months to read the book so that it would at least be seasonally relevant. But I didn't because I wanted to get it out of the way so that I could talk about it before I forgot what I want to talk about. Anyway, I might do Tindayeth after that because I was very intrigued by the intro chapter of Tendayeth, so it might be a really interesting book to talk about on the channel. I don't know, we'll see after I read the rest of the book. We'll be back to that. But the feature is hopefully to help other readers who find your work with the most objective way that I can think of for sharing content without putting my opinions in it, and that is just straight reading the chapter. It is time for your authors to shine. If you submit with an AI-generated cover or it reads like AI generation, it will not be read. This is for writers to share what they've been working on. And then the third thing is, if you would like to check out any of my books, they're available at any of your favorite places to get books, including the local library upon request. My newest novel, Body More Zero, is coming out October 31st, featuring these two gentlemen right here. I love them. I love the book. It is my favorite of the Body More series just because of the brotherhood between these two men and the story. I mean, I I love Joey too. She's a hot mess. <laughs> Casey is a hot mess, but in a different way. Anyway, I look forward to sharing it. I hope you guys like it. If you check it out, if you don't, I also understand because book tastes. Am I right? With that said, let's jump into this book. Now, before we really actually even get into the 
synopsis and the story discussion, I want to ask you, did you ever read Judy Bloom when you were in school? Did you ever read her from school libraries or regular libraries or part of the curriculum? Had you been exposed to her? One of the things that I saw while going through the reviews for this book was a number of people saying this was the kind of book, one of the types of books that they would hide from their parents because they felt naughty reading it. <clears throat> and that was kind of the appeal of it, which what a lot of YA books do now that hide the uh, the saucy content in them. And especially the, uh, oh my gosh, my, my least favorite trend in general, which partially feels like fraud and partially feels like a kink because it is exposure secretly, is erotica authors and romance authors know that their genre is so full to the brim that it is very competitive that they then tack on other genres to try to sell their erotica and their romance, specifically erotica, as like sci-fi, as Western, as anything else, because they got to get out of that crowded field to make their thing stand out. But then you, as a person who reads fantasy or sci-fi or horror or or Western end up with this freaking erotica that was mismarketed. And then they also brag about changing the covers so it doesn't look like erotica because they don't want it to look like erotica. So it is specifically to signal to erotica readers and to hide it from non-erotica readers while also uh, STDifying all of the other genres. It pisses me off. Anyway, also funny side note, uh, the book that I am reading currently as I am recording this is... A, an Akatar knockoff that is Christmas themed. And um, well, it suffers from one of the same issues where this book does, which is funny and disturbing at the same time, since this is a 50 year old book. And that is that the main characters have no skills, no interests, no personality outside of making sexual comments. And you can imagine that for an erotica. But then like, why are we looking at teenage realistic fiction where the character, the main character has zero anything else. So that's interesting. As always, if you're interested in a full scope of this book, unadulterated and unfiltered by my perspective, because all I can do is share with you my perspective, how I read it, how I packaged it, and the thoughts that I have as we go. If you want that without my opinions, I highly recommend you check out the book for yourself. Otherwise, this is going to be a book discussion led by my reading. With that said, let's get into the novel. It opens up with, quote, Sybil Davison has a genius IQ and has been laid by at least six different guys. She told me herself the last time that she was visiting her cousin Erica, who is my best friend. Erica says this is because Sybil's fat problem and her need to feel loved, the getting laid part, that is. The genius IQ is just luck or genes or something. I'm not sure that either explanation is 100% right, but generally, Erica is very good at analyzing people. I don't know Sybil that well since she lives in Summit and we live in Westfield. Erica and I decided to go to her New Year's party at the last minute for two reasons. One, because that's when she invited us and two, we had nothing better to do. Interesting that it's already decided that because she is fat, she needs to sleep around in order to feel loved. Uh, I wish that we would actually run into discussing what that means and why this person feels loved through having sex or why there is that connection, but we will never have the main character actually think about these things and instead, it actually gets really icky. Um, so what the party is, is a fondue party, and there's not much time spent here, but being introduced to some other boys like Fred and Michael. Michael is making out with some girl named Elizabeth, while Fred, who the main character describes as a creep, is talking to Catherine, the main character, and she's pretending to listen while watching Michael go at it with Elizabeth. When the party's over, the girls help clean up and then go upstairs to Sybil's room since they're spending the night with her. Erica also asks Catherine if she'd be interested in Michael at all which is a weird question to ask when he was just downstairs making out with some other girl. She says that he's a nice guy and Catherine is like, yeah, he is, but he's like too tall for you because he's, she's trying to discourage Erica from having an interest in Michael because she thinks that Michael is hot. But also, I don't know. I Maybe I'm the weird one here. I already know that I'm the weird one. Okay, I accept that. Let's just get that out of the way. But do you really, if you're, if you don't have an infidelity thing, if you don't have a man stealing thing, because that's a complete thing on its own. But if you don't have that, have you ever like been at a party or been in a place and like seen somebody doing something with somebody else and been like, you know what, I want that person sloppy seconds, specifically, like I need that. 
that somebody macking on somebody else was the was the Pied Piper call that you need to get in on that action. Was that ever something that you experienced? Because for me, it's so weird. Because for me, if I'm like, if I were at a party and was watching Michael, or and if I was at a party and saw Michael with another girl, I would think, okay, they're an item. That means do not pursue. But immediately, Catherine is in the bedroom like, hmm. I want that to be me. Which doesn't really bode well for my opinion of Catherine. If we're already going to start out with her wanting to be a home wrecker, but Kevin looks better than Catherine to me. I'm sorry, that is my that is one of my character flaws. <laughs> anyway, the point of saying too tall is also because Erica is like four foot eleven or four foot ten. I can't remember. She's like tiny, and so Catherine uh, brings that up. Erica says that Michael was asking about Catherine, which also tells me that Michael feels like kind of a player if he was making out with another girl and then was asking about Catherine, or is Erica lying about it to try to get Catherine to fess up to feelings? The world will never know. Catherine is told that Michael was asking about her name and her phone number and all of that, and Catherine is super excited. Now, I wish instead of Catherine watching Michael make out with Elizabeth, you'd actually had Michael and Catherine talking to each other to, like, show that interest, because we go to the bedroom after the party, and then suddenly Michael is interested in freaking Catherine when he didn't even bother trying to talk to her at the party. Like, he didn't. It was only Fred. Catherine also talks about Erica's background in this moment, being of Russian descent, a small family, and her last name is Small because when her parents got off the boat when they came here, they were just called Small by the guy logging them, and that was the last name that they got. Erica saying that she'd like to marry somebody tall, so if she got married and had kids, they would have a chance to be normal-sized between, you know, equilibrium of their heights. She also says that Erica's family connections are likely to get her into a good school. Meanwhile, Catherine freaks out about little nothings, and Erica is chill about super important stuff, showing that Catherine is a mess. We time skip to the next morning and Michael is coming back to Sybil's place for something. Catherine is interested and Sybil is like, you want me to put in a word for you? I've known him since childhood and Catherine says no, but then Michael comes back and is talking to Catherine, starting with small talk like, I came back just to see you. So that sort of even nullifies the conversation with Erica the night before is they didn't even need to have that conversation because Michael was going to come back the next morning anyway and then start up a conversation with Catherine. So maybe that would have been a better place to introduce that he is either a player or was also tangentially interested in her or, you know, give him a reason for coming over other than he just showed up. Again, we're going to get no motivations here which just looks like unskillfulness of the author. And I don't know if this author has skills in other books. They are lauded for some reason. But with this being my only exposure to this book, and I never heard of Judy Bloom before I started looking at the ALA lists and the banned books list, the removed books lists. Um, with this being my only exposure, I'm like, why are you popular? Of course, the 70s was another time. Maybe this sort of writing was popular in the 70s, but it's not good. Catherine doesn't know how to respond to Michael's interests. Quote, Oh well, I saw my reflection in his glasses. Is that all you can say? What am I supposed to say? Do I have to write a script? Okay, I'm glad that you came over. He smiled. That's better. How about a ride? My car's out front. My father's coming to pick me up at three. I have to go back by then. That's okay. These chapters really don't start with any sort of setting, so then when we get a new setting, it just into the next thing. And you know, I when I was reading this, I was like, I keep worrying about, about how I'm going to handle predisposed to bliss and like time skipping through a couple of years there and moving stuff along and moving chapters. And then I read this and I'm like, I wish it was easy, this easy for me to just spew stuff out and not care because that's what it feels like. Anyway, here's another quote to open the chapter with because it's hard to just give you a quick surmisation of what's going on, so it might as well just be, quote, Everyone says that Erica has insight. I suppose that's how she knew that I was interested in Michael before I admitted it to anyone, including myself. It's true that I come on strong with my sarcastic act sometimes, but only when I'm interested in a guy. Otherwise, I can be nice and friendly as they come. Erica says that means I'm insecure. Maybe she's right. I just don't know. A few minutes after we pulled out of Sybil's driveway, we drove past Overall Hospital. I told Michael that I work there every Thursday after school. I'm a candy striper, I said. I was born there, too. Hey, so was I, he said. It's so weird that 
Number one, we've still got this trope 50 years ago, which is funny to me, where it's, I'm not going to show the character being nice, I'm just going to tell you that she's nice, well, she's probably going to be kind of a dick, but just believe me, like, she can be nice when she wants to, and everybody thinks that she's nice and she is nice, but, like, just believe the narrative that it's saying that she's nice, even if you never see it. Michael and Catherine then later go to a local lake and walk around, barely have any conversation, but at time skips, and this is supposed to pass as building a relationship. Also, when I'm reading the dialogue, if I just go back and forth between dialogue, it's not because I'm cutting anything out. It's because a lot of this book is literally just a dialogue, no tags, no actions, no nothing. It'll just be dialogue. So again, it just feels low effort, low tier. It didn't even freaking try. Quote, what are you doing next year? Going to college? Where? I don't know yet, I said. I applied to Penn State, Michigan, and Denver. I have to see where I'm accepted. What about you? University of Vermont, I hope. Either there or Middlebury. Michael took my hand and pulled off my mitten, which he shoved into his pocket. Holding hands, we started walking around the lake. I wish it would snow, he said, squeezing my fingers. Me too, you ski? No, I just like snow. I love to ski. I know how to water ski, I told him. That's different. Are you good? At skiing, I mean. You might say that. I could probably teach you. To ski? Yeah, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. We walked all the way to the Trailside Museum and had a look around inside before Michael checked his watch and said, We better head back. Already? It's after two. My teeth were chattering and I knew that my cheeks would be bright red from the wind. I didn't mind, though. My father says that I look good that way. Very healthy. I just don't see anything in this. It just, like, implies a conversation, very base, empty conversation, and then, and then tries to pretend like this passes as building a relationship or caring or trying to get you invest in these characters who are doing literally nothing. And that's a comment that I have in general for suggestions for authors to think about when they're writing is... For me, at least, you get somebody more invested in your character if they're trying to accomplish something. It doesn't have to be anything big. They could be attempting to get a sandwich because they're hungry and then it gets complicated. Attempting to return a cart. Attempting to save the world. Attempting to save their sister. Attempting to study. Attempting to get into college. Anything. Give them a goal. And then things that interrupt that. Because as long as they have a goal that they are trying to achieve, a motivation... And then you can even see their shifting motivations, their shifting focus. Then it gives you something to focus on with that character, to cheer for that character. And then you're going to be watching them in their story try to accomplish that thing. And so then it actually builds your feelings for that person. But if they're not doing anything, if they have no motivation, if they just kind of exist, then you have these empty scenes where the conversation is back and forth and meaningless. They get back to Michael's car and he asks if he can kiss Catherine and she pretty much says that it's awkward to ask, but yeah, he has permission. Catherine wets her lips, Michael stares at them lips, then they laugh at how awkward he is, then he leans in and kisses her. It ends with, quote, before he let, quote, before he let me out at Sybil's house, Michael stopped the car and kissed me again. You're delicious, he said. No boy had ever told me that. As I opened the car door, all I could think about to say, all I could think to say was, see you. But that wasn't at all what I meant. She also spends a lot of time being dropped off at Sybil's house, even though she says she's not really friends with Sybil, but Erica is. <laughs> then it makes you wonder if Erica lives at Sybil's house. Catherine goes home, tells her mom about meeting a boy. And mom asks about said boy. Catherine says that she's meeting him later that week to go out. And also it turns out that mom is so charismatic and beautiful that she should be a movie star or something. But she's actually just a librarian in the children's section at the public library and can eat whatever she wants without getting fat or gaining any weight and can eat whatever she wants without going over the perfect weight of 109 pounds at five foot six. Catherine's then cutting her nails. Don't ask what info about her mother had to do with anything. It's nothing. It was just, it feels like it was just inserted. Like tidbits about characters just feel like they're inserted pointlessly to break up the dialogue because they don't mean anything. Did you think that Erica having Russian descent parents would mean something? Joke's on you, it never comes up. You never get anything else about Erica's background. So anyway, Kat's cutting her nails when her sister Jamie comes in to show off a pair of jeans that she has embroidered, asking what Kat thinks of it. Kat asks if she can do that to one of her pairs of jeans before next week because she wants to wear those jeans on a date with Michael. Quote, 
Jamie is in seventh grade and looks a lot like me, but her eyes are fabulous, big and round, and if you look into them, you get the feeling that you can see deep inside of her. Sometimes they seem very dark, with just a rim of green, and other times they sparkle and are greenish-gray all over, like my grandfather's. The rest of us have ordinary brown eyes, but my father's brows grow straight across the bridge of his nose. He told me that when he was in college, he used to shave them up the center. Jamie untangled herself. Jamie untangled herself from me. What's next weekend? She asked. I'm seeing someone I met last night, I told her. And the truth is, I don't know how I'm going to live through the week. You mean that you're in love again? I have never been in love. What about Tommy Aronson? That wasn't love. That was childish infatuation. You said that it was love, I remember. Well, I didn't know anything then. Oh, someday you'll understand. I doubt it, Jamie said. You're going to find that Jamie is much more accomplished, much more reasonable, much more thoughtful than freaking Catherine, who has no sense of self. Funny again that you have the stereotype trope of uh, dissing on brown eyes. Why is that a thing? Kat doesn't want to talk about Tommy anymore because they used to date, quote, I wish she hadn't brought up the top... I wish she hadn't brought up the subject of Tommy Aronson because I did like him a lot last year, but only for a few months. Now he's at Ohio State, and the news that I get is he's busy making it with every female on campus that he may flunk out. I hope he does. Sex was all that he was ever interested in, which is why we broke up, because he threatened that if I wouldn't sleep with him, he'd find somebody else who would. I told him that if it was all he cared about, then he should go right ahead. So he did. Her name was Dorothy, and she turned up in my English class last year. Michael was different from Tommy Aronson right away. He called me every night. You'll find out, uh, spoiler, he is not different from Tommy. I don't know why this book treats it as if he's different from Tommy. I don't know if that's just supposed to show how naive this character is, but co considering the note that's at the beginning of the book from Judy Bloom, I don't think that that's supposed to be how you take it. Let me know what you think, and I will go over the note at the end of the book, at the end of the review, so you can know what Judy Bloom's goal was with this book after we get through it and then i want you to compare what happened in the book with what judy said her goal was but um it's funny that Catherine will say she dumped tommy because all tommy wanted was sex and then get ready for what we're about to go through with freaking michael as we keep going there's some stupid conversations time skipping and then quote i'm sitting on my bed with a beautiful 15 oh I'm sitting on my, and she's talking to Michael, quote, I'm sitting on my bed with this beautiful 15-year-old. Oh, yeah, her name's Tasha. She's gray and furry, and she's got a beard, but I love her anyway. I laugh. A schnauzer? How'd you guess? The beard. Isn't 15 kind of old for a dog? In people years, she'd be 105. Can she still get around? Sure. She just doesn't bark much anymore. Wait a second, and I'll put her on. Say hello to Catherine, Tasha. Don't be shy. Hello, Tasha. I said, arf, arf. The next night, I asked Michael if he plays tennis. No, really, why? Do you? Uh-huh. I'm on the school team, I said. Oh, a jock, huh? Hardly. Just that and modern dance. A dancer, too. Um, sort of. You jump a you jump around wearing one of those things? What things? You know. A leotard, you mean? That's it. I wear one. I'd like to see that. Some day, maybe. If you're lucky. On Thursday night, he said, Did I tell you that I'm trying to get my ski instructors pinned by next week? No? Yeah, I am. Do you have any chance? Do you by any chance like spinach? Uh, no. Why? Do you? It's only my favorite food. Like Popeye? Like Popeye. Uh, if you think that her playing tennis or being a dancer is ever going to come up, it's not. She even goes to an art camp later at the end of this book where there are dancers and she doesn't like them, doesn't want to participate, doesn't have any interest in any of that because when she gets her boyfriend, all of her interests are gone. We never see her tennis. We never see her do anything. And so for me, it's like, what, is she a dancer and do tennis just so she can maintain her pretty body? Like, so you can justify why she looks the way she looks? Michael later comes over and, Michael later then comes over and is introduced to her parents. The house is described as, quote, I have to explain about our house. It's very ordinary on the outside, but on the inside, it's really something like Michael said. All of the walls are painted white and are hung with the millions of Jamie's paintings and tapestries, which are all done bright, colorful colors. Her artwork is not your everyday 12-year-old. She is what is called a gifted child. When you combine my mother's plants with Jamie's artwork, you don't need anything else. Our furniture is very plain and it's all kind of beige so that you don't notice it, which is the whole idea. 
Jamie comes running out of the room also to meet Michael, saying that she was afraid that she missed it. Quote, in many ways, Jamie is still a little girl. She looks up to me, at least that's what my parents say, and I think that they might be right. It took a long time for me to realize that, but when I did, it helped me get over being jealous of all of her talents. Not that I don't get a pang now and then, like when Michael admired everything that she's made, and I know that he wasn't just saying it to make her feel good, but that he was really impressed. Dude, she's really impressed, to the point that she asked her sister to embroider her pants instead of freaking learning how to embroider herself. She could be a part of this, and instead, she has no skills, and then she just... She is just jealous of her sister's skills. Constantly. Also note that Jamie is 12, Catherine is 17 slash 18, getting ready for college. So it's also weird that they go... For, so it's also weird for the narrative to go, in many ways, she's still a little girl. Bro, she's 12. She is in every way a little girl. What are you doing? Uh, after introduction to the family, Michael and Catherine then go to the cinema, and she just thinks about what they're going to do after the cinema. She's not interested in the movie, you see. She's interested in the man. Skip through the movie. We don't even know what movie they went and saw. No name was given. We don't know the genre. It just wasn't important. It was a backdrop for her thoughts about having sex later. And it's kind of insane to me how obsessed she is with wanting to be alone with this guy and get physical when she was introduced as having dumped the last guy that she was with because all he wanted from her was sex. And so then you've got this character that has zero motivation, zero desire for even a relationship, and all she can think about is when she can get with him in bed. Kat offers that they go back to her place because her parents would rather she be at home with them with her friends than parked in a car somewhere else, which that turns into this, quote, I really do know where people go to park. There's a dark dead-end street not far from where I live, and there is also a golf course on the hill. Erica lives on the hill. She's always finding used rubbers in the street, and I can't understand how someone could just throw a thing like that out a car window and forget about it. My mother and father talked to me about parking when I first started going with guys who drove. They explained how it isn't safe, not because of anything we might do, but because there are a lot of crazies in the world, and they have been known to prey on couples who are out parking, so I've always invited my boyfriends home. We have a den on one side of the living room that is very private. It's got a door and everything. It's small, but there's a fireplace and two tilt-back chairs in front of it, a stereo built into the wall unit, and a comfortable sofa under the windows with the kind of cushions that you sink into. There's a big, beautiful hooked rug on the floor with a lion's face in the middle of it. So they're very rich. They are obviously very well off. She sneaks into her room without telling her parents that she had gotten back and they get to first base. Michael asks Catherine if she's a virgin and she's surprised that he would just come out and say it and says that no one has ever been that forward before. He says, you don't need to be ashamed of it. And she says, let's save something to do for tomorrow and not go all the way. The chapter ends with, quote, it occurred to me in the middle of the night that Michael asked if I was a virgin to find out what I expected of him. If I hadn't been one, then he probably would have made love to me. What scares me is I'm not sure how I feel about that. If you thought that there would be further thought or examination on this, there's not. The next chapter starts with some random exposition about Kat's pharmacist dad and where he works, and you also get Kat saying that her dad tells her 109-pound mother to not get flabby. Quote, My father keeps warning my mother that if she doesn't start to work out at the gym soon, she'll wind up with flabby thighs, and I can't imagine my mother with flab anywhere, but just a few months ago, I overheard a divorced friend tell her, You really should take better care of yourself, Diana. Roger is so attractive, and he's at that day dangerous age. Bullshit, my mother answered. But when I was nine and Jamie was four, we had a babysitter who had a thing for dad, and as soon as my parents left the house, she would run up to his closet and touch his things. She even smelled some of them. Finally, I told mom, and we never had that sitter again. Okay, there is so much what the frick about this. The mother is 109 pounds, and the friend is like, uh, you're gonna get flabby, and then you're going to die. Look, I know that anorexia was the look, a look in in the 1970s, but, uh, what? And also, it's her fault if she gains a couple of pounds that her husband then goes and cheats on her? Right, she deserves it because she weighed 115 pounds at 5 foot 6. Oh my gosh, what a fat ass. And also, uh, why are these books always so full of weirdos? You can't just have a babysitter that has a crush on dad. You have to have a babysitter who has such an infatuation with dad that she runs upstairs and smells his stuff when he's gone. 
random stuff then about how there's some random stuff about store sales picking up around the holidays for last minute shoppers, which is weird since mom is a librarian at a children's corner of it. Since mom is the librarian of children's corner and dad is a pharmacist, like what sales are picking up around freaking holidays? Does he have a different job? Because people just pick up their medication all the time. It's, it was, it, nobody in her life works regular customer service jobs that would pick up around the holidays. So it was just a weird, I didn't understand where the information came from. Grandparents on the dad's side are both dead. Grandma then ran for Congress and lost. Both live in New York. Grandpa had a stroke and doesn't do much anymore these days, while grandma is still heavily involved in politics, planned parenthoods, and now even at age 70. Grandma wants Erica to get into politics because Erica is good at making friends with everyone. Quote, the night before my parents left for their vacation, they said that it would be all right for me to have some some friends over. Michael brought Artie Lewin and I asked Erica, one thing about Erica, you never have to worry about her getting along with anyone. You can fix her up with the worst guy in the world and she'll act like he is someone special. That doesn't mean that she'll make out with him, but she will find something to talk about and he'll always call and ask to see her again. Grandma says Erica would make a great politician. Note how Grandma doesn't have any aspirations for freaking Catherine, but does have aspirations for Catherine's friend Erica. Hmm, that's interesting. Also, why are we going back in time on this book when this book started out with New Year's and now we're back to uh, Christmas season is picking up on shopping? Now we switch to Catherine sitting around with Artie and Erica playing board games when Michael gets there. Michael and Kat flirt about the lifelines in her hands, and at 10.30, Kat's parents are in bed, so the kids go out to get food and then turn all the lights off. Erica, Erica, and Artie go to another room to do who knows what, leaving Michael and Kat to make out, get frisky, take her bra off, but then she stops him from going for her jeans, saying that she is not ready yet, and she worries that he's mad. Quote, Michael rolled over onto his stomach and kind of groaned. I bent down and stroked his hair. You're not mad, are you? No. You sure? Yeah. But this is really rough. I know it. She dumped Tommy because he wanted only sex from her, and now she is worried about this guy being disappointed for not getting sex? Where did the line go that she had before where she was like, I'm not just going to be that for you. But this guy, she's like, I'm selling out. I got no aspirations but to sell you the P. The P-U. Uh, because we're not dealing with a P-E. She says that she wanted to wait on, she says she wanted to wait this time because Artie and Erica are in the other room and she's not sure about doing it when, you know, other people are around. Now she wants the boys to go home and once the boys leave, Erica and Kat talk about them. Erica's disappointed that Artie didn't try anything with her. Kat lies about them doing much and Michael says that he is super experienced. Kat lies about doing much with Michael and says that he is super experienced. Erica says if Kat is a virgin... Erica then asks if Kat is a virgin, and she says yes, quote, Is he? I don't know. I haven't asked. I've been thinking, Erica said, that it might not be a bad idea to get laid before college. Just like that? Well, I have to be attracted to him naturally. What about love? You don't need love to have sex, but it means more that way. Oh, I don't know. They say that the first time's never good anyway, which is why you should at least love him, I said. Maybe, but I'd really like to get it over with. What's the point? I'm always thinking about it, wondering who's going to be the one. Like tonight, I kept picturing myself with Artie, and in school, I sit in class thinking about how it would be with every guy. Really? Yes, even the teachers. I wonder about them too, especially Mr. Frazier, since he never zips his fly all the way. Tell me the truth, Kath. Don't you think about it? Well, sure, but I want it to be special. You're romantic, Erica said. You always have been. I'm a realist. You're starting to sound like some kind of professor. I mean it. We look at sex differently. I see it as a physical thing, and you see it as some way of expressing love. That's not completely true. Maybe not. But that's the picture that I get. Well, you don't know Michael. That's all I can say. What is even this conversation? She is saying that she wants to have sex as an expression of love, but also that's not that at all that it is, but that's also what it is because Michael is special and Erica doesn't understand, but also don't you want to have love before you have sex? But also she's like playing both sides and I don't understand. She doesn't have a clear point of view and it more to me reads like the author couldn't devote to something, couldn't stick with something because the author didn't agree with that idea. The author wanted to write a sexually empowering thing so she, so the author couldn't even make this character just say I want to have sex for love and then have Erica be the other one and instead so had to have this character uh Catherine play both sides of the fence 
Not only does the little sister Jamie do embroidery and tapestry art, BT dubs, she also knows how to cook. She also plays the piano. We'll get into that. She also dances. And Grandma plans on cooking with her without involving Kat whatsoever. She doesn't ask Kat if she wants to help. She doesn't ask Kat to peel potatoes. She just goes, hey, Jamie, want to go shopping and make Thanksgiving dinner together? What does Kat even do? We don't know. She has no hobbies, no personality, nothing at this point. She doesn't write, doesn't do anything, but hang out with her friends and think about boys, apparently. Jamie did all of the work cooking for Thanksgiving while Grandma did the small jobs because Grandma is a bit feeble. Jamie is trusted with all of the food prep while Catherine, the 17-year-old getting ready to go be independent in college, does nothing. She then says that her parents are somehow happily married, despite a chapter ago saying how dad was threatening that she better not gain any weight or she might, you know, be cheated on. She also says that they argue, the, the way that she knows that they're happily married is that when they argue, they laugh afterwards because it's just a jolly good time. And that because her grandparents were happily married, that means that her parents were more likely to have a happy marriage as well. After saying that about her parents, randomly switch over to Michael picking up Kat from the hospital where she works. She is in the geriatrics area, and she explains why that is. Quote, Well, when I was a little kid, my father's mother lived in an old age home in Trenton, and every Sunday we had to drive down to see her, and I always wound up crying. You sure you want to hear this? Uh-huh. Okay, and I realized that he was old too, but I wasn't afraid of him because I loved him. I guess that doesn't make much sense to you, but that's why I asked to work in geriatrics. So my parents would explain it by saying I was overtired from the long ride. But the truth was, I hated the place. The just smell of it made me feel sick, you know? Go on. Well, I never really knew my grandmother as a person that is. Um, she was just some old lady with crooked fingers and wrinkled skin, and I was kind of afraid of her and of the other old people, too. And I was scared that one of them might grab me and hide me in a closet and my parents wouldn't be able to find me. I looked over Michael before I went on. Then, when I was about seven, my grandmother died and I was glad because we didn't have to go to Trenton anymore. God, I've never told anybody the story. I took a deep breath. So anyway, my grandfather, that was my mother's father. Well, you'll meet him tonight. When he got sick last year, I went to the hospital to visit him because she loves her grandfather because she feels bad about not caring about her other grandmother. After this explanation, Michael switches gears and goes, okay, BT dubs. Artie from school, he's in a school play as like a leading character. And we should go to that, then go to this party at Elizabeth's house that, that comes afterwards. Kat asks why they should go. And wasn't Michael with Elizabeth? Wouldn't it be awkward if they showed up? And he's like, I mean, I was with her, but like, what's it matter? I'm with you now. Quote, we were together, but it wasn't anything special. Still, won't you feel funny bringing me to her house? Why should I? Michael took one hand off the wheel and reached for mine. We go together, don't we? It's no big secret or anything. I tighten my fingers around his. This is even more weird in retrospect because we're going to learn that he had one girlfriend previously. It was not this chick. It was some other chick that gave him the clap, which was the only time that he ever had sex. And so he's been awkward around girls and awkward with sex since then, but somehow he is also a player that was with Elizabeth and had no problems switching from Elizabeth to freaking Catherine on the same night? That doesn't feel thought through. It feels like the author switched the, the direction that they wanted to take Michael and then never changed it because th those two things don't really work for me. This is where the scene also ends. They don't even get to the end of that conversation. It just abruptly comes to an end. Uh, so again, if you were expecting any sort of retrospect, especially considering this book is supposed to be like, hey, look, a relationship of teenagers that is educational for the youth. That is my Judy Bloom voice. Yes, um, you're not going to get it. We get into Catherine's house where her grandma, grandpa and Jamie are entertaining the neighbors, their family butcher and the butcher's family. It's really random and the butchers never come up again. They're not important. I don't know why the frick they're there. And uh, we never discuss this again. They eat dessert made by Jamie and she's super happy. Michael leaves. Grandma stereotypically addresses Kat about her boyfriend. Quote, later, Grandma said, He's a nice boy, Kat. I know. Intelligent. Uh-huh. Attractive, too. I agree. Just be careful. That's my only advice. Of what? Pregnancy. Grandma. And venereal disease. Really? Does it embarrass you to talk about it? No, but it shouldn't. But listen, Grandma, we aren't sleeping together. Yet. 
grandma said. Grandma, mind your business. Okay, stop talking about your crusty syphilis vagina. Nobody asked. It's none of your business. And then we get this monologue, quote, In the old days, the girls were divided into two groups, those who did and those who didn't. My mother told me that. Nice girls didn't, naturally. They were the ones boys wanted to marry. I'm glad those days are over, but I still get angry when older people assume that everyone in my generation screws around. They're probably the same ones who think that all kids use dope. It's true that we are more open than our parents, but that just means that we accept sex and talk about it. It doesn't mean that we are all jumping into bed together. I was really surprised that grandma thought Michael and I are lovers in the true sense. Have you not been spending this entire book thinking about being alone with Michael and, you know, him taking off your clothing and like doing literally nothing but thinking about being alone with Michael? And you're like, how dare grandma think that I am a hussy? What else do you got going on, girl? Maybe there's a reason that your grandma thinks this of you. She's like, where are your hobbies? You know, your sister's over there doing macrame. The final night, on the final night that grandma and grandpa are watching the kids and staying with them, they have concert tickets and they worry about leaving the kids alone, but they're assured that it's going to be fine. Michael is, of course, invited over. Jamie feeds everybody because um, she's apparently the second most reliable person in the house, the second most responsible, not Catherine, who can't take care of Jamie by even putting a hot pocket in the microwave. Quote, Jamie cooked all day. She made veal marsala, spinach salad, and lemon chiffon pie. Michael devoured everything. So, you know, just, just cut ties. Why are we not following freaking Jamie watching her sister crash and burn? We'd see more stuff going on. I just don't understand why we care about Kat, why we're supposed to care about Kat. Jamie departs to go and play the piano, and she also has an art studio in the house. What, what does Kat have? Kat says that her and Michael will go and do the dishes, which turns into flicking a water fight, quips, and running around the room. Quote, I only use ivory. That's why everyone thinks I'm 18 instead of 38. My hands don't give me away. You idiot. I flicked the, some soap bubbles at him. Hey! He reaches into the sink, picks up a handful of suds, and threw them at me. So I tossed some more at him, and he tossed them back, and we had a terrific water fight until both of us were dripping and laughing hysterically. I cried, No more! More, Michael, please. He wiped off his face with a dish towel and then started snapping at me. Work, slave, work. Clean up the mess. Stop it, I told him, jumping away, but he kept snapping the towel at my legs. I ran around the kitchen, shrieking with Michael chasing me. Only now he was aiming the towel at my behind. I'm going to get you, I said, reaching into the broom closet. I came out with a feather duster and tickled his face. What is this scene? It came out of nowhere. Then they, once they're done water fighting, they also decide, hey, let's wash each other's hair in the sink for no reason. With their shirts also completely soaked, Catherine says she needs to go and change. And Michael follows, and when she tries to close the door on him so she can change, uh, he doesn't let her. Quote, he pushes it back open. I'll stay. He pushed it back open. I'll stay. Oh, Michael, come on. I promise I won't touch. He closed the door behind him. I took a sweater and bra out of my dresser drawer while Michael bounced up and down on my bed. Very nice, he said, firm, but not too hard. I'm glad that you approve. Did you know that soft mattresses are no good for lovemaking? Michael, really, I mean it. That's very interesting. Now, would you please leave so that I can change? Are you ashamed of your body, Catherine? No, of course not. Then what's the difference if I stay? Oh, I shook my head at him, turned away and unbuttoned my shirt. I pulled it off and unhooked my bra, which was also wet. Then I hesitated for a minute and slipped that off too. I reached for my dry bra and put it on. All at the same time, neither of us said anything. Then Michael was behind me. You promised, I reminded him. I'll hook it for you. That's all. Don't bother. It's no trouble. But instead of hooking it, he slid his hands around my breasts and kissed my back on my neck. Please, Michael, don't. Why not, Kath? Because there was a knock at my door and Jamie called out. What, what are you two doing in there? The kitchen's a mess and it's almost time for the nine o'clock movie. Coming, I answer, hooking my bra and pulling on my sweater. Then I turn to Michael and whisper, that's why. Excuses, excuses, he said. Ha ha. So are we just not going to talk about how he is pressuring her, how he 
guilted his way into that room, how he told her that he wasn't going to touch her and then took advantage and tried to touch her. And then when she said stop, he didn't stop and continued and then tried to shame her and coerce her into doing more when she says no and then continuing to shame her when she still said no. And he goes, you don't have a real excuse to tell me no because now you're making stuff up with your sister. Are we really just ignoring what just happened in the scene? Am I crazy for looking at this that way? Because uh, this does not look good to me. She told him no like three or four times, and every time he pushed the boundaries. And then when it came to an abrupt end, he tried to guilt her for saying no again. They go out to watch the movie. It ends promptly, and he leaves. Jamie wishes that Michael had a younger brother because he is so nice, and she wants to date a guy that is nice just like her sister is dating. She then asks what Kat and Michael were doing in Kat's room, and Kat answers, quote, Nothing. Michael just wanted to see it. Come on, Kath. I won't tell anybody. There's nothing to tell. I know all about sex. Congratulations. Were you fucking? Jamie... That's not a bad word. Hate and war are bad words, but fuck isn't. I never said that it was. So were you? No, I wasn't. But even if I was, I wouldn't tell you. Why not? Because it's none of your damn business. That's why. Oh, wow, she said, clucking her tongue. Your generation is so hung up about sex. Okay, this entire conversation between these two is just feels like Judy Bloom. okay? These are not a 12 and a 17-year-old. And then what the frick is a 17-year-old doing saying, oh, your generation is so hung up. Aren't you both the same generation? Number two, um, it's none of your business. This bothers me so much, and it comes up all the time, is people that are sexually open, sexually engaged, whatever, they will, like, spew all of their sexual garbage at you without you even asking. You don't even want to know. And then when you tell them no, that you don't want to talk about it or you don't want to hear it, one, they violate your boundaries by continuing to push it on you. And then two, uh, they bug you thinking that they earned or deserve or are owed your private information. And then they try to coerce you with this bullshit. How are we not talking about what this is, which is an attempt to coerce Catherine? And to tell Catherine that she has no right to privacy because her little sister is interested and she is somehow ashamed and somehow treating sex in this bad way if she wants to keep it private by not telling her 12-year-old sister about it. Uh, excuse me, is it not considered inappropriate for a 17-year-old to talk to a 12-year-old about sexual intercourse? I don't care if it's family because your family can also sexually abuse you. How many stories are there of cousins and brothers and sisters and parents sexually molesting their children, their sisters, their siblings? So then why is it in here like, oh, yeah, totally. Just have that 12 year old harass the 17 year old to be sexually explicit about her exploits. And we're not going to talk about this. It's weird. And this was written by a 37 year old in 1975. Catching up with Erica in zoology class later, because this class, the high school has a zoology course, apparently, she asks how things are going with Artie. Surprise, they haven't done anything yet, and Erica is outraged that he hasn't even tried. She says that she knows Artie likes her, and says that she knows Artie likes her because he invited her to the school play. But if he doesn't mac on her before then, then she is going to take matters into her own hands because she is not waiting for freaking ever. So again, we get the coercion of these, this social situation where he's not allowed to wait. It's, you got this sex pest Erica that says you are going to put out or I am going to put out on you or I am going to dump you just like Tommy, which uh, surprising that... Catherine doesn't say anything to Erica, considering that is exactly why she dumped Tommy. But, you know, I digress. Let's just ignore the fact that this is going on. You don't have, according to this book, and I've ha been in those conversations, you don't have a right to say no or else you are the bad person. I have been called antisocial for saying, no, I don't want to talk about this. I see what you're doing. It's coercive. It's wrong. They go to the school play and are super impressed by Artie's art skills. Sybil McFatty face, and I have to say that because they remind us how fat she is every time she's brought up, is there looking fatter than ever. And Elizabeth Hot Buns is somehow dressed in the world's skimpiest bikini during this play. They go to the party afterwards, talk to different people who were in the play and Erica is pretty sure that she's getting laid tonight because Artie is feeling high, feeling good. His performance was great and everybody thinks that he is great and she's like, I'm getting some. Kat doesn't care and says good luck with that without being enthusiastic. She just talks to different people, is surprised that Elizabeth is actually nice because uh, Michael isn't with her. So 
I mean, she thought she was going to hate her, but talking to her, she seems fine. She also tells Artie that he did a good job until Michael is ready to leave. They go back to Kat's place and she asks if he's going to come in and she's like, you know, you don't have to do me any favors. You can come in if you want to come in. And he does, and then asks her what her problem was tonight because she seemed distant and moody. It comes out that she was acting jealous, apparently. I didn't see it in the scene. She was just disinterested in the party, which just made me think that she didn't really want to be there. She didn't know anybody there. She didn't care. He's like, oh, so that's why you were a bitch tonight, because you were jealous? And she says, I guess so. He says that he's glad to know that she cares, and then it switches topic. Quote, hey, I dreamed of you last night. Michael said, what was I like? Very sexy. I took his hand and we went into the den. I'm sorry I was such an ass tonight. Forget it, he said. It's nice to know that you care. Just promise me one thing. What? From now on, we're honest with each other. If something's bothering you, say it and I'll do the same, okay? Agreed. Good. We lay down on a rug, and after a while, Michael reaches under my skirt, and I didn't stop him. Not then, and not when his hand was inside of my underpants. I want you so much, he said. I want you too, I told him. But I can't. I'm not ready, Michael. Yes, you are. You are. I can feel how ready you are. No, I pushed his hand away and sat up. I'm talking about mentally ready. Mentally ready, Michael repeated. Yes. How does one person get mentally ready, he asked. A person has to think. A person has to be sure. But your body says that you want it. I have to control my body with my mind. Oh, shit, Michael said. It's not easy for me either. I know, I know, he put his arm around me look we can satisfy each other without the whole thing we will soon if i didn't know any better i'd think that you were a tease i'd never tease you yeah i know that too you want me to be honest right uh-huh well the thing is i don't know exactly how to do it satisfy you i mean it's the easiest thing in the world michael said loosening his belt not now i told him when soon but not tonight promises promises so again he's pressuring her to have sex and that was the reason she dumped her last boyfriend, and she's not this time. And she's not even thinking about how she thinks that she has to do this. There's no introspection whatsoever on this relationship, on the way that this is going. And again, we're also breaking Michael's character because we're going to find out soon enough that Michael, again, I already said he only had sex once. Uh, when he goes to have sex with her the first time, he is going to ejaculate before he's even inside of her just from his peen touching anywhere near her because... That's how it is. And then he barely gets it inside her the second time before he ejaculates. So, like, he's acting like this Don Juan. Like he's, like, he's this suave dude who has all of this experience, but he doesn't. And so why is he, one, so desperate? And then, two, acting like this, when later he is such, like, he is so ashamed of himself by how it goes later. And it doesn't line up with this. Continue with the quote, After Michael went home and I was in bed trying to fall asleep, I thought about making love with him. The whole thing, like he said, Would I make noises like my mother? I can always tell when my parents are making love because they shut their bedroom door after they think Jamie and I are asleep. It's not hard to... It's hard not to listen. My room is right next to theirs. Sometimes I hear them laughing softly, and other times my mother will let out these little moans or call Roger, Roger, even though I know it's natural. And I'm glad that my parents love each other. I can't help feeling embarrassed. What would it be like to be in bed with Michael? Sometimes I want so much, and other times I am afraid. Did we cross into the wild here? Where, you know, teenager listening to her parents have sex in the freaking other room and the camper? And what is with these authors and some unresolved issues with listening to their parents have sex? Like, I feel, or, or voyeurism. They could just be voyeurism over here. It is just such a weird statement. And this is not the only time that the book will reference, will have the character think about her mother having sex while she is thinking about herself having sex. And uh, comments, chat, please tell me, is that weird? Or do you think about your parents? Did you think about your parents uh, having sex? when you're getting hot and bothered is that something is that across is that a normal thought across your mind because i understand that i am a freak i am trying to audience test here to see what is the general consensus because uh i would not think that when you are being laid out you're thinking about how you moan like your mother and that is what is going to happen eventually um i also don't think most kids go you know it is so great that my parents love each other enough to fuck but it is embarrassing and it's so natural. Like it is so natural to have sex, but like it is also embarrassing. Just don't think about it, okay?
I just, I don't know any normal teenager that thinks constantly about their parents having sex. But then you get into some of these, these re removed books and these kids are obsessed with their siblings and their parents' sex lives. And it is bizarre to me. How, is it just because I don't have that kind of close relationship with my family, but this is like normal without crossing into incesty vibes? On another note, you've got the pressure again. You've got him pushing her into it, saying, I don't understand why you don't want to do this. Come on, babe. You say you're not ready. You say that you need to be mentally ready. What the hell does that even mean? Just do it. I feel your your waterfalls on my mushroom clouds. It's the same BS back and forth. And then, I, and then I'm looking at this, and I'm like, it's the same BS back and forth blue balling with no thought put into it that's just there to sustain the book. We're not even halfway through this book. But it shows that there is such little thought put into Catherine's character that this is the only way that the author could think to prolong the story because you can't have them have sex that's supposed to be some ideal moment and they're not working toward anything it's just there so it has to be built up as this thing but there's no actual roadblocks in the way no actual character building in the way no actual meet and meeting in the way because boy meets girl was just how it went Michael wants to take Kat over to ski during Washington's holiday, Washington, during Washington's birthday holiday weekend. Kat's parents aren't sure about letting her go yet, but she assures them that there will be chaperones. Dad is apprehensive. Later, she's telling Erica about it. Quote, my mother will let me go, but my father seemed kind of scared to say yes. That's logical, Eric said. Fathers have complexes about their little girls. They can't stand the thought of their precious darlings having sex. You think that that's what's bothering him? Absolutely. It was nothing to do with breaking your legs, like I said. It has to do with breaking your cherry, oh, Erica. <laughs> she laughed. Uh, but I'm willing to bet that your mother talks him into letting you go. God, I hope so. Erica is right. Uh, her mother does does talk into that. Also, Erica then starts talking to Kat about Artie and his potential gayness. Quote, I'd love to go with Artie. I take it things have improved between the two of you. It depends on what you mean by improved. You know what I mean. They haven't improved that way, but we're just getting honest with each other, and you can't have a decent relationship without honesty, am I right? That's just what we were talking about last night. Michael said practically the same thing. It's true, yes, but you said that you're going to do something drastic if nothing happened after the party. I did. When he took me home from the party and kissed me goodnight on the cheek, I came right out and asked him, Artie, are you queer? You didn't. Wanna bat? What'd he say? He said, I don't know, Erica, but I'm trying to find out. Jesus. So I asked him, Artie, how can you find out when all we ever do is play games, Monopoly, Bingo, Chaz, the backgammon? They're coming out my ears. And... He said, I'm scared to try, Erica. Now that's being honest, wouldn't you say? Definitely. So I told him not to worry, that I'll help him find out, and he said that he'd really appreciate that. So next weekend, while you're in Vermont, if I get to go, I said, if you get to go, Artie and I will be trying to get to the truth. Off screen, her parents agree to let her go skiing, so the whole thing earlier was stupid and just a reason to talk about her dad fearing her losing her cherry. Also, she has gotten a new jacket, some new clothing. She's told that she didn't need all of that stuff because Michael's family would have provided her clothing, but she's like, I get to look hot now, though. I get to look saucy. As she prepares for her trip, her dad sits her down and says that he needs to let go of her because she is going off to college in the fall and, she, and there's like nothing to this conversation for real. Oh, and it's so much worse too because you get to the later part of this book where she's supposed to have a job over the summer and he's like, BT Dubs, I got you a job at summer camp. And she's like, what? I don't want a job at summer camp. And he's like, well, you don't have a choice. So here he's saying he needs to let her go to be an adult because she's going off to college and gonna have to make her own decisions. And then just a couple of weeks later, when summer comes around he's like yeah you don't get a choice you're still my child and I'll do what I want you to do so is he trying to let her go or is he trying to help guide her still because again no character no motivation no nothing it's just a freaking PSA from Judy Bloom without story quote before I went to bed, my father came into my room and sat down on the edge of my bed like he used to do when I was little. He took my hand. I'm glad that you decided I could go to Vermont, Dad. Well, you'll be off to college in the fall and I have to let you go sooner or later. I guess you're not my little girl anymore. I guess not. 
And you have a lot of common sense, Kath. You've always made intelligent decisions. Still, you and Michael are very young. We're not planning to elope if that's what you're worried about. I'm not worried. I just don't want to see you get hurt. I told you I'll be careful. Not that kind of hurt, Kath. Oh, Dad. I like Michael. And it's not that I don't trust him. Daddy, he's not a sex fiend, so please stop worrying about us. I can't help it. I sat and hugged him. Everything is going to be fine. Really. If anybody is a sex fiend in here, I mean, it does look like Michael. Uh, but she's the one that starts dreaming about Theo when she's away from Michael. So so they go to the ski resort. And it's important to tell you the plot that Kat got her period and she told Michael and how disappointed she was that it happened so they couldn't have sex while they were away. She's she's like, I'm not sure if you would still want me to go knowing that. And he's like, uh, why wouldn't I want you to go? So again, she's assuming that Michael only wants her around to have sex with her. And yet she doesn't have a problem with that, despite having a problem with that with her previous boyfriend. It's also insanely contrived. Again, it's the forced blue balls in order to make the moment be pushed out further because the author has to carry the story and has no plot, no action, no motivation for the story. So it's just try to hold off on having sex in any way possible. The next to push off the sex will have Michael collected by the government over student loans, despite the fact that he hasn't even been to college yet, so he doesn't have student loans. After the mom says that she works in anthropology and they always have trouble finding girls interested in that area of study, Kat says that she'll look into it someday and maybe study it in college before she goes to bed. Michael comes in after the two are in their PJs and she checks again that he's not mad at her for not being able to have sex with him. And he's like, look, I came in because I wanted to make sure that you knew that I invited you because I wanted to be around you and the sex isn't important. I'm not mad or anything. But then you get, quote, we kissed again. Then Michael held me away and said, I wasn't going to touch you tonight just to prove that I didn't get you up here for sex. I'd have been disappointed, I told him. I even wore my best nightgown. Do you like it? It covers too much of you, but it's nice and soft. Michael reached over and turned out the lamp on the night table. How do you work these crazy buttons? He asked, trying to undo my nightgown. I unbuttoned them myself. I want to feel you against me, Michael said, and he took off the top of his pajamas. Then he lay down and put his arms around me. Oh, it feels nice like this, I whisper as my hands wandered across his naked shoulders and down my and down his back. Michael kissed me and reached down between my legs, and I caught his hand and moved it away. No, not tonight. I don't care. But I do. It wasn't so much that I didn't want him to touch me, because I did. It was just that I didn't think that it was a good idea for either of us to get carried away. Michael, don't get too worked up, okay? I'm already worked up. He didn't have to tell me. We kissed one more time, and then he touched my face gently and said, I love you, Catherine. I really mean it. I love you. I could have said it back to him right away. I was thinking it all along. I was thinking, I love you, Michael. But can you really love someone that you've seen just 19 times in your life? I never said that before, he told me. I'm glad. I'm more to hold you all night. I want you to. And we slept in each other's arms till Ike's voice woke us up the next morning. So, he would have gone there if she let him, but he went in to make sure she knew he didn't just go there for sex and then immediately started trying to court her into sex. And we're not going to talk about it. She's not even going to acknowledge that's what he was doing. Okay, so they go skiing, Cat falls on her face a bunch of times, turn in for the day, find out that the parents smoke pot. Cat is profoundly surprised because uh, his dad is a doctor and he smokes pot. The, the devil's lettuce? Who What? And Michael is like, okay, it's not that big a deal. It's not like they're addicts. She keeps thinking about wanting to be with and lay with Michael, but also she is like, maybe I should remind him that I'm on my period so we can't actually have sex either. And, and she's asking if she should get into her nighty, and he's like, yes, you definitely should, but leave it open this time. <laughs> Then they lay in bed together where he rubs against her until she comes and then she asks him what she can do for him and we get, quote, After a minute, I reach for Michael's hand. Show me what to do. I said, do whatever you want. Help me, Michael. I feel so stupid. Don't, he said, wiggling out of his pajama bottoms. He led my hand to his penis. Catherine, I'd like you to meet Ralph. Ralph, this is Catherine. She's a very, very good friend of mine. Does every penis have a name? I can only speak for my own. In books, penises are always described as hot and throbbing, but Ralph felt like rather ordinary skin, just like shaped, 
Just his shape was different, that and the fact that he wasn't smooth exactly, as if there was a lot going on under the skin. I don't know why I'd been so nervous about touching Michael. Once I got over being scared, I got my hands to go everywhere, and I wanted to feel every part of him. When I kissed his face, it was all sweaty, and his eyes were half-closed. I took my hand and led it back to Ralph, showing me how to hold him, moving my hand up and down according to his rhythm, and soon Michael moaned, and I felt him come a pulsating feeling, a throbbing like the book said, then a wetness. I got it. Some of it got into my hand, but I didn't let go of Ralph. Question chat. Um, if you were in a romantic situation and someone did this, introduced you to their genitals by their Christian name, how would you respond? Alternatively, have you named your genitals? Is this something that you do and have you introduced your partner or partners to your genitalia? by Christian name. Also, let's review. Michael be like, I didn't invite you here to the skiing trip for sex, you know, and then tried to have sex with her on both the first and the second night and can't just lay with her. He has to try to push the envelope every time. So, um, I didn't invite you here for the sex, but sure. Then we, then he says that he loves her forever, and it's so stupid contrived that this author doesn't even feel human, but like an alien in a woman's skin. Apologies to aliens who may be offended by this. Mom and dad are waiting for her to get home on the couch, and dad has a brief comment about how spending time with someone can be the quickest way to kill a romance. And he's like, look at me and your mother. I mean, or really... This makes her wonder if her dad wants her to stop seeing Michael and if her dad doesn't like Michael. The next day, Kat asks her mom about this and mom is like, no, your father doesn't necessarily want you to stop seeing Michael. He's just having trouble accepting things, you know? And Kat's like, good, because I wouldn't want to dump him. Um, that's not happening. In the car, she asks if her mother was a virgin when her mother got married and saying that she knows that her mother said that she was, but like she's obviously accusing her mother of lying to her right now. And her mother is like, we stopped at a red light. Mom turned to me. I was a virgin until we were engaged, not married. But what about how about dad? There were double standards then. Boys were supposed to get plenty of experience before marriage. The car behind us tooted. The light screen, I said, oh. We drove to East Broad Street and under the railroad tracks. Are you glad that you waited? I asked. I don't think of it in terms of waiting. I was just 20. If you had to do it all over again, would you still wait until you were engaged? Everything's different now. I wouldn't have married so young in the first place. But would you have waited? I can't answer that. I just, I just don't know. I didn't say anything more than that, but when we got to school, instead of just dropping me off, my mother pulled into the lot and turned off the ignition. Look, Kath, she said, I've always been honest with you about sex. I know, but you have to be sure that you can handle the situation when you jump into it. Sex is a commitment. Once you are there, you can't go back to holding your hands. You get addicted to the P. E. I know. I know it, Mom. And when you give yourself both mentally and physically, well, you're completely vulnerable. I've heard that before. It's true, Mother said. It's up to you to decide what's right and what's wrong. And I'm not going to tell you to go ahead, but I'm not going to forbid it either. It's too late for any of that. I'd expect you to handle it with a sense of responsibility, though, either way. I wasn't asking for personal reasons, Mom. I was just curious, really. Of course. She reached out and touched my face. Well, have a good day, sweetheart. What does it exactly mean by once you have sex, you can't go back to holding hands? Is it saying that once you go all the way, you have no reason to say no because you've already put out? Because, yes, you can say no at any time. You can also go back. Is it saying that the P is too good that you just can't resist doing it more? So, like, once you get the D, you become an addict, a didict, and you can't go back? Like, what kind of messaging is this that it is trying to share? And this is a message-driven book, because the characters don't exist. The characters are vehicles for Judy Bloom to talk at you. Kat is grateful for her mother's speech, kisses her on the cheek, and then at lunch, you have Erica harassing and belittling Kat again for being a virgin. Quote, I absolutely can't believe it, Erica said after I told her about my weekend. You're still a virgin! Uh, I'm not saying it one way or another, but I can tell. How? I just can. I knew in a second that you weren't. Again, we're not going to talk about this pressure, this humiliation, this harassment. 
But, you know, we know that Erica is all about harassment because she's harassing freaking Artie to sleep with her. They squeal about Michael saying, I love you and how romantic that is. And then Erica talks about playing strip poker with Artie and that he's definitely not gay. And you have to have, and you get this asinine conversation, quote, anyway, we didn't do a thing but touch and I'm beginning to feel like a therapist. You could be doing him more harm than good. I thought about that, but he's very open about his problem. He's not gay. We've determined that. He's just impotent and I've been reading up on it, and I'm sure that I can help. But Erica, if you want to get laid so badly, why don't you find someone else? I could get laid tomorrow, BT dubs, she said. But that's not the point anymore. I want to make it with Artie. Why? Because I think that I can help him, and for one thing, and because, well, just because. So she wants to sleep with him to fix him. No deeper conversation about fear, expectation, if she's trying to push this guy who's possibly gay and it's lying. None of that. It's, it's just Erica thinking that she can fix this man with her cat and she is going to make it happen because it is a point of pride now, okay? She needs to make this man accept her V. They finish by calling Kat lucky that she is Michael, while Erica over here stuck with Artie. And by stuck, I mean with she's choosing Artie. Erica, Artie, and Michael and Kat then meet up. Artie gets into an acting school, but his dad isn't going to let him go, and he's upset about it. His dad's like, you're going to go do academics like a real man. Michael says, Artie probably won't do very well in normal school because he's just not interested in academics. Kat asks Michael if he thinks that Erica and Artie are good together, and Michael is like, I don't know. He's super popular, and he's not trying to see anyone else, so that has to mean something, right? Then at home, Kat is telling her parents how serious she is about Michael, and Mom brings up some other guy that she'd gone steady with in high school to try and quell daddy's fears about Michael being a steady fixture in her life. I don't know why they're so panicked about Michael. You would think that if she's chosen Michael, then they'd be like, you know, that's fine. It looks more like it's the author's bias against you can't have a genuine relationship in high school because mother also is like, well, I got married when I was 20. So it, it reads more like just rejection of any idea that youth could have meaningful relationships. And while there are a lot of relationships that start out in teenagerhood that don't amount to anything. There are also a lot of people that meet in high school and middle school even, and then eventually get married and do stay married. So it's a bizarre thing to have a bias against in general, because you're also trying to pretend that there is only one way to have a relationship, and this is the wrong way. Also, if you're afraid that your daughter is sleeping with him already, why would you discourage her from being with him to then go and test the waters with other people because i thought this was oh daddy is afraid of his daughter you know growing up and having sex but also uh don't don't just settle on that one man you need to try the water sweetie so now we're just encouraging her to sleep around instead of you know so it's not really about his daughter having sex is it she talks to her guidance counselor about applying for colleges where Michael is, and the, the counselor says, well, we need to talk to your parents about that because you're not just allowed to apply for any college you want and just switch. And uh, if your parents don't like it, then you can't do it. Then she meets up with Michael, and he says, guess what I got? And she's like, VD? And he gets mad because she just accused him of having an STD, and then he admits that he had one from the first and only time that he's had sex. And Kat is like, wait, what? You've only had sex one time i thought you were more experienced than that and he's like uh getting the clap kind of turned me off to sex it didn't really seem that way when he was macking on elizabeth at the beginning of the book but here we are after he recovers from his angry spat he says okay so what i actually came to tell you is that i have keys to my sister's apartment and it is empty so we should go there and do some things and don't worry we're just gonna talk like if i do some things i don't mean it has to be anything schmexy we can just talk just like, you know, the ski trip. Nothing sexy was meant to happen then, huh? Michael takes her to the apartment, shows her around. The bedroom is, of course, last because they're just here to talk. No pressure. And the flirting starts, quote, He let go of my arms and I wrapped them around him and we kissed again. You're beautiful, he said, looking down at me. Don't say things like that. Why, do they embarrass you? Yes. Okay, you're ugly. You're so ugly you make me want to puke. Blah. He turned his head away and leaned over the side of the bed, making that terrible retching noise. Michael, you're crazy. Stop it. I can't stand it. Okay. They make out on the bed. He keeps telling her that he loves her, and he is touching her and talking to her about how he feels. And he is touching her and talking about how she feels so good next to him. Uh, and he brings up his dog. 
quote, We lay next to each other, kissing, and soon Michael unbuttoned my sweater, and I sat up and unhooked my bra for him. While I slipped out of both, Michael pulled his sweater over his head, and he held me. You feel so good, he said, kissing me everywhere. I love to feel you next to me. You're so soft as Tasha. I started to laugh. What? Michael asked. Nothing. So she thinks of her parents when things are sexy, and he thinks of his dog. We're not going to address that at all. The two of them jack each other off and keep laying next to each other. Next time, Skip, and the next night, and they get into having sex, where she doesn't want to do it on the bed just in case she bleeds, and so he goes and gets a towel, and then um, we get into things. Quote, He ran his hand up and down my body, but nothing happened. I guess I was too nervous. Michael, do you have something? I ask. What for? He said, nibbling my neck. You know, didn't you finish your period? Last week. But I'm, I'm not taking any chances. If you're thinking about VD, I promise I'm fine. I'm thinking about pregnant. Every woman has a different cycle. Oh, okay. He stood up. I've got a rubber in my wallet. If I can just find it. He looked around for his pants, found them on the floor next to the bed. He then put on a light to find the rubber. When he did, he held it up. Satisfied, he asked, turning the light off again. I will be when you put it on. He kneeled beside me and rolled on the rubber. Anything else? Don't be funny now, please. I won't, I won't, he said and we kissed. He then he was on top of me and I felt Ralph hard against my thigh. Just then I thought, oh God, we're really and truly going to do it. Michael groaned and said, oh no, no, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. What's wrong? I came. I don't know what to say. I just, I came before I even got it in. I ruined it. I ruined everything. It's all right. I told him. It's going to be okay, really. No, it's not. They go get burgers, get more condoms, come back, try again. This time, he pretty much comes as soon as he touches the inside of her, but she feels the sharp pain of the insertion before it all ends, and she's disappointed that it wasn't perfect, even though she says that she is also not disappointed at the same time as being disappointed. Quote, On the way home, I thought that I am no longer a virgin. I'll never have to go through that first-time business ever again, and I'm glad. I'm so glad that it's over. Still, I can't help feeling it's a letdown. Everybody makes such a big deal out of it actually doing it, but Michael is probably right. This takes practice. I can't imagine what the first time would be like if with someone you didn't love. Next day, she thinks of her parents. Next day, she's worried that her parents' virgin radars are gonna go off, but they don't. Her ex, Tommy, calls to meet up with her while he is in town, and she's like, uh, no. So he asks for her friend's number and name, number or name, Erica's number and name, so that he can call her instead. And freaking Kath gives her ex Erica's number. Was Erica, one, not steady with Artie, and two, uh, does she not hate Tommy, but she is totally okay with hooking Tommy up with her best friend? What? Do you not dislike Tommy? And you just like, you know what? It's a free game. Everybody is free game. And uh, if my girlfriend, my best friend starts dating Tommy, you know what? That's just the awkward that we're going to have to deal with. But I'm totally fine with him using her, even though I was not fine with him using me. Later, Mom visits Kat to give her a clipped article from Times. Quote, My mother came into my room that night. I cut the article out of today's Times, she said, handing it to me. And I think that it has a lot to say that you might find interesting. I got comfortable in bed, adjusted my lamp, and looked at the article. Maybe Mom could tell about me after all. The title was What About the Right to Say No? And the subtitle was Sexual Liberation. It was written by a director of medical clinics at Yale. He said that... He was always asking adolescents, am I still considered an adolescent, four questions when he talks to them about sex. One, is sexual intercourse necessary for a relationship? Two, what should you expect from sexual intercourse? Three, if you should need help, where will you seek it? Four, have you thought about when this relationship, how this relationship will end? It feels so weird. It feels so forced. Quote, he went on to explain each question. In his discussion of question two, he said that enjoyable lovemaking culminating in orgasm isn't easy. It usually requires mutual education, and it takes time, effort, and patience to learn to make love. That made me feel better about last night. It's funny because I used to think that if you read enough books, you'd automatically know how to do everything the right way. But reading and doing are not the same thing. 
She's later then asked by her mother if she agrees with what the thing said, and she says she agreed with some of it, but disagreed with other parts, like how a, a how a relationship comes to end, which is also ironic since she's the one that's going to end the relationship with Michael by deciding she wants to sleep around on him and be like, "No, Michael, just wait for me." And he's like, "No, if you're gonna go and pick other men, I am not sticking around." Which, duh, you can't have all of it. Freaking Catherine. At school, Erica mentions Tommy Calder, and Kat's grateful that she assumed if hot Tommy wasn't on Erica's mind, then that means that Erica can't give her the third degree about losing her virginity. That's probably why her virgin radar didn't go off, right? She's then thinking about how she's not friends with some of her school friends anymore, and it's so weird how people grow apart, while also thinking about how her ex-friend, Janice, has everything planned out with her long-term boyfriend to the point that Kat thinks that her life is dull. I don't know. If Janice and her boyfriend are happy with their life, who are you to judge? cat be jealous because you got nothing you got nothing girl <clears throat> she also complains about how does janice not know that the friendship is over when janice keeps inviting her to do things and she's like i don't even like janice i won't tell janice but make janice pick up the notes janice just keeps inviting me to shit and it's like why doesn't she know better Ugh. Michael comes over, and the two of them study. Little sister gets sussy that that's not all that they're doing, but it is all that they're doing because they have some important tests coming up. And Kat is just so tortured, her soul so tortured, because she has to wait until Friday to get freaky because they have to make sure to pass their tests. And she's like, ugh, how will I survive? My mama was right. After you have the D, you can't go back to not having the D on the daily. That's why it's called the D. Skip forward, there's no school on Friday. Kat agrees to meet Erica for a movie, and Kat also gets a letter from her grandma about going steady with Michael. So here are some fit pamphlets for Planned Parenthood and venereal disease. I'm available. I don't judge. I just advise. So call me if you need anything, sweet cheeks. She says the info grandma sent her is all super interesting and then calls her grandma about Planned Parenthood to say thank you. Grandma says that you're welcome. Now don't tell your parents that I sent you this stuff because we got different viewpoints on things, and also you want to meet for lunch when I'm in town, when you're in town. After hanging up, she finishes reading the literature from Planned Parenthood and thinks, wow, I know so much that I should start a service at school providing information to other students. Right. A teenager who read a bunch of pamphlets one time is definitely equipped to start becoming a sexual informant for teenagers in a school. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> Especially considering she just said in the narrative that reading and doing are not the same thing. But you know what? There's a girl who's in school who is pregagonant who doesn't even know how she got pregagonant because she doesn't understand you get pregagonant from intercourse. Oh, my. I don't think it's up to the teenager to do that. Like, this is, oh, my gosh. There have been so many conversations about this. It is confusing as frick. So follow with me on this, okay? I am told that these books need to be in schools because some kids don't get sexual education or very good sexual education. But the schools should also give sex ed because the schools will give good sex ed. But this book needs to be in school to teach good sex ed just in case they don't get good sex ed elsewhere. So are schools teaching sex ed or are they not? And then you're supposed to rely on these books that are supposed to be informative but also the teachers and the school districts are supposed to be informative but it's a shit show okay that's all i'm trying to say is it's a shit show and it says the parents the schools the random school books and planned parenthood are all in charge of educating your children just in case everybody else fails <laughs> But also, there's no oversight on any of it. She then calls Planned Parenthood to ask about birth control, and she's told that they have special sessions for underaged people so you don't have to tell your parents. An appointment to set. Randomly at the movie screening, and we barely mentioned that she's with Erica and her mother. Erica is barely mentioned at all, as most of the discussion is with the mother, and it really doesn't matter because we skip through the movie, skip through the conversation. She then says she has to go and get lunch with her grandmother and her grandfather, and she meets them, and we get this scene with the grandparents pretty much fetishizing um, teenagerhood. So, Grandma said when Basil had finished with us, let me get a good look at you. She narrowed her eyes and inspected me, and I, t I tried to keep a straight face, and finally she, she said, Wonderful, glowing. Oh, Grandma, people don't really glow. That's such a silly expression. What do you mean, people don't really glow? Of course they do. Don't be embarrassed, dearie. It's very becoming. She looked across the table at Grandpa. Don't you, doesn't she glow, Ivan? I gave her Planned Parenthood pamphlets. We know that she is doing the naughty and she is glowing from it. <laughs> it must be love to me. Catherine is always glowing. 
Grandpa said slowly. It must be love, Grandma said. I could tell that I was blushing, even though I didn't have to. Grandpa raised his water glass to love, he said. Grandma clicked the glass against his to love. She also says that she wants to keep the appointment at Planned Parenthood a secret from even her grandparents because she wants it to be a little thing that she just does for her and for Michael because she'll tell Michael later, but not right now. Seems overly excited about getting on birth control. But, you know, what would I know having never been on birth control? Quote, I watched as grandma helped him into a cab, then I started walking. There's something about walking in New York that really appeals to me, especially on a bright sunny day. I took off my jacket and hung it over my arm. I felt like smiling at everyone and on the street, even though I know that you shouldn't do that in New York. It could lead to big trouble. Imagine that she just gets mugged at that moment. <laughs> now, the scene just abruptly ends right there. She's like, don't smile at people in New York. They will freaking punch you in the face. <laughs> push, you, push you into the train tracks. She goes to Planned Parenthood, where she sits in a class with other people, asks questions, and gets a presentation. And then she's ta taken to an individual one-on-one, -on -one where this chick who is super hot, and Kat assumes that she is very sexually experienced because she is super hot, and she works at Planned Parenthood, so that must mean that she is immensely uh, experienced in the, um, the didgeridooing, if you know what I mean. You just get this rapid fire back and forth Q and A of medical history. That would then be an example of like, maybe what you would, some version of what you would get when you're getting looked at by a doctor, but it's even more, uh, dry because it's just, have you been ill? Are you pregnant? Have you ever been pregnant? When was your last period? Blah, 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 blah. Is your mother ill? Or does your mother have any long-standing medical issues? Blah, 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 blah. And then you get a description of a physical and a gyno examination. The doctor asks if she wants to see her cervix during the examination. And she says, I don't know. And here we have the doctor again coercing her where she's like she's nervous she's like i don't know if i want to see it i don't really want to see it and this person is like it's good for you to see your own body so yes you should look at it i asked you politely if you wanted to look at it but let me be clear you don't really get to say no so here is amir look into your cervix don't accidentally get sucked in by the way it, it's ha <laughs> it's happened okay you stare too closely at the cervix and you just get sucked right in and then we got to call in the specialists and let me tell you, you don't want a service, cervix self-extraction specialist in here, okay? It's messy. Messy business, okay? She gets her birth control, and she's very excited about it and wants to tell Michael as soon as possible. But as soon as she gets home, she gets told that Michael called and said that he was sick, so she's not going to be able to see him for a couple of days. Two days later, she's now got the flu. 104 degrees. They talk on the phone to meet up in a couple of days once they're both feeling a little better, and Michael is coming over. Kat's mother, for some reason, won't let her take a shower to wash her hair. You know, if she's got 104 degrees, a cold shower would help lower that temperature. So, like, why is she not allowed to wash her hair? Was this a thing in the 70s where mothers were like, look, you're going to get yourself ill-er if you get into the shower when you have a fever? Is that, like, what is behind this? Is this a cultural difference? So he gives her a bracelet or a necklace. I, I remember it saying necklace later in the story, but it says bracelet here, and I don't really remember which it actually states at this point but anyway so he gives her a bracelet that says Catherine Michael and forever on it in return she shows him that she's on the pill and they're both super excited but they don't have a chance to be alone yet so they just say goodbye and try to figure out a time where they can be alone together eventually they go to Michael's house he shows her around and includes the bathroom which gives you this conversation as she goes through his cupboards do you ever put it on your balls I ask I don't shave them he said, I read that in a book. This guy put aftershave on his balls before he went out with his girlfriends. Well, maybe I would too, if I thought of anybody was going to smell them. Who, who did you have in mind? Oh, I don't know. Just anybody. He put the bottle on top of the toilet and unbuckled his jeans. What are you doing? I'm going to try it now, so I'm ready. Just in case, winky face. He stepped out of his jeans and then took off his underpants. On second thought, he said, Why don't you do it for me? Me? It was your idea in the first place. I felt funny about seeing Michael exposed weight from the waist down because it's always been dark when you make love. I've touched him a lot, but I've never looked carefully. He sensed my feelings because he said, You want to know me inside out, don't you? So I looked. 
His hair down there was almost the same color as the hair on his head, maybe curlier than mine. Dark. Maybe curlier. Mine is very dark. Much darker than on my head. Hello. Hel hello, Ralph, I said, kneeling in front of Michael. Ralph was small and soft and just hanging there. I shook some mustache onto my palm of my hand, and then I, I, when I reached out toward Michael, he caught my hand and said, Don't. It stings. How do you know? I just do. So apparently he was lying about one never putting it on his balls and two wanting her to put it on his balls. It was just an excuse to take off his pants. They go to have sex. He comes way too fast again. It's awkward. They go to bed. He gets hard again while they're laying there and they actually have sex the second time when he gets hard again. Quote, we got into bed and fell asleep for an hour and when we woke up, Ralph was hard again. This time, Michael made it last much, much longer. Push him deeper and deeper into me and I spread my legs as far as I could as I raised my hips off the bed and I moved with him again and again and again again, and at last I came. I came right before Michael, and as I did, I made noises just like my mother. Michael did, too. While he was still on top of me, catching his breath, I started laughing. I came, I told him. I actually came. Michael made sounds like her mother? Survey, survey of TMI. How many people think of their mother making sexual noises while you are orgasming. Doesn't seem like a natural thing to me. I'm just saying. Seems like, seems like Judy Bloom may need to have a talk of some unresolved 86-year-old issues. But I'm going to leave that there. The two of them go and get food together, go back to Kat's place. He sticks around for a bit so that they don't look sussy to the parents. Oh, and Michael says that he has named his dick just for Cat, though that's where that ends. She asks where the name came from, and he's like, I just named it for you. That's all. And then he leaves. The book is not even trying. It is not. Next day, Cat's being judgmental, saying that her sister has gotten into a relationship with this kid named David, who, she says, looks kind of like Michael. However, love at 13 is fake compared to the love at 18 because Jamie is so excited to go away to summer camp and not see David even for seven weeks. So that means that Jamie obviously doesn't freaking care because she also has hobbies and a life and, you know, can live without her boyfriend, live without a man for seven weeks. How dare she? Clearly, the devotion that Cat has is beyond... Jamie's ears. Okay, Jamie just doesn't understand true anything because a child would not be able to live without their partner if they were truly devoted. Kat and Michael are trying to find summer jobs partially because they were told to by their parents, um, but neither of them can because they both suck. Erica gets a cool exclusive job because <laughs> only... The only loser in this book is actually Kat. And then they talk about fat-ass Sybil being pregnant, apparently. Quote, Oh no, and she doesn't know who the father is. Oh God, and she's too far gone to have an abortion. The baby's due in early July. I've counted on my fingers. That means that she got pregnant in October. Uh-huh, and never even missed a day of school. Jesus, why didn't she say anything? She wanted to have the baby, and she knew that if her parents found out, they'd make her have an abortion. You mean that they didn't notice? She's so fat. You know, she just kept wearing those tents of hers and nothing showed. Didn't she go to the doctor? Yeah, and she told them that she was married and gave them a phony name and address. What's she going to do with the baby? Oh, she knows that she can't keep it. She'll put it up for adoption as soon as it's born. Then why have it in the first place? For the experience, she told me. So, like, this is also a weird point in the book that is never discussed. Like, later, when she has the baby, one of the first things Erica says is she should have aborted it. So, you know, you've got this chick who decided to have the baby, and Erica's first thing on the day of the birth where they visit is, you should have aborted it. But you're, you're treating birth control in this story Regardless of any personal feelings, okay, we're discussing the way that it is set up in this. You're showing birth control as an empowering thing in this, where abortion is a woman's option, a woman's choice in this. However, would not be Sybil's choice. It's supposed to be empowering if Erica's like, hey, you should have aborted it so you could go to college. But if Sybil says she doesn't want it, then the parents force it on her, and there is no discussion of that choice being taken away from her. That the parents are using the abortion against the will of the mother of the child. But yeah, let's not talk about that and only look at birth control as a woman's choice, the woman who is going to be the mother. Let's never talk about the parents or the friends trying to pressure somebody into getting an abortion. It's all just about, you know, empowering you so you can go to college. And also... 
What the frick is, I want to give birth for the experience. This is going to come up again later after the birth happens, because she's like, I'm going to give it away, but then I'm going to get a an IUD or whatever it's called so that I can not get pregnant because I don't want to give up sex because once you have sex, you can't go back to holding hands, wink, wink, not a little bit up. You can't ever, you know, just be celibate. You can't choose to be celibate. Like, who, who has control over their urges to just be celibate? Nobody, especially once you get the P and the V. You can't stop. There's, you're an animal, man. And so she's like, I can't give up the sex. I don't want to give up the sex. I am a hoe, so I'm going to get an IUD so that I can control when I get prego the next time so I can keep the baby. So then what was the point of, I wanted to give birth now for the experience of it, even though I'll get the experience of it in the future when I have sex for the point of having a child with somebody I love because I wanted it for the experience makes no sense if you're going to do it again later. They both talk about how if they were pregnant, they would both rush to have an abortion like immediately. So they really don't understand Sybil wanting to have the child. And Erica's mom got so worked up about Sybil being pregnant that she scheduled a gyno appointment for Erica to get Erica checked out and Erica birth control just in case, even when Erica was like, look, I'm a virgin. And mom was like, I'm not taking those chances. We are getting you some birth control, bitch. So I guess very progressive household going on here because she's like, I don't care if you have sex. I just don't want you to have a child. So Michael and Kat are going to be going to different schools and different places. They make plans to take different terms off for one another because they're both going to tri-semester colleges. So they'll just alternate which semester, which one of them is taking. So then they can go to each other going on. We also find out that despite Sybil being pregnant, she got into Smith, Wellesley, Holyoke, and Stanford. Seems like everyone in this book is way more put together than Kat, who is a loser who can't do anything but think about messing around with Michael. And then is surprised that she was and, and all of them are surprised that she was accepted into any of these schools because she is pregnant. At dinner, she is told by her parents that they found her a summer job at Jamie's summer camp, and she breaks down into tears because, no, she doesn't want a job. She doesn't want to do anything but boink Michael all summer. Like, you can't take that away from her. What is wrong with you? She It, it makes me think that she never really had been looking for a job and was lying in the narrative about looking for a job and being unable to find one. She breaks down into sobbing, legitimately, acting like her parents are freaking whipping her as she's saying she doesn't she doesn't want to go she's she's 18 and she can't they can't tell her what to do she's an adult now and they're like you're gonna go and she's like what you're not gonna give me the free choice i thought you expected women's rights you respected women choosing and you're not gonna let me choose and dad's like no we're not letting you choose based on her response <laughs> Based on how, how dramatic she is i feel like she needs time away from michael like her entire identity is in this guy and not in a healthy way. She considers running away from home because of this, but eventually when Jamie comes in and talks to her, she's like, no, I'm not gonna run away from home, but this freaking sucks. Later, she's celebrating Michael's 18th birthday early with Erica and Artie, and Artie is having an existential crisis as they blow out the candle. Quote, 18 years, he said. A quarter of our lives gone by, over, kaput, just like that. He snapped his fingers. From now on, it's all downhill. No, it's not, I said. It's just the beginning. The best part is still coming, Artie said. Sure, you spend your whole life trying to make it, and for what? So that you can wind up in some cancer ward full of needles and tubes with nobody giving a shit? That's what you've got to look forward to. That's what we've all got coming. Artie, please. Michael and Kat retire to Michael's room where they have sex, and she mentions the job that she is forced to do this summer, and he mentions that he actually got a job in North Carolina as well, and she's mad at him for not telling her sooner since he found out he got a job three weeks ago and didn't say anything, which probably could have stopped her from having a meltdown if she knew that he was already going, or she would have melted down on him and been like, no, don't leave me, Michael. They try to have sex again, but Michael can't get hard, so they just rejoin Artie and Erica in the other room. Were the two of them just awkwardly sitting in that room waiting for Michael and Kat to finish? They were just like staring at the wall, listening to the rhythmic sounds coming from the room and just waiting. The boys leave and Erica is in her room crying. Kat asks what's up and Erica says that she found Artie in the bathroom threatening to kill himself. <laughs> if you're wondering where that came from. Nowhere. It came from nowhere. I guess it's just because... Erica's pee therapy sucked so much that he wanted to die. 
Erica says when she found Artie in the bathroom, she ran to Michael and and uh, she ran to Michael and Kat to let them know, but they were in the middle of having sex, so she didn't interrupt. So she came back to the bathroom and Artie was dressed and uh, pretending that everything was fine again. So um, she says that they're going to break up and it's probably better this way. A spoiler alert, it's not better. It, nothing gets better this way. The next chapter starts with Artie having tried to kill himself at home by hanging himself from a curtain rod and he fumbles and fails and ends up with cuts and bruises. Kat says that maybe this is the best thing that could have happened because now he's going to be institutionalized and possibly get the help he needed for his suicidal thoughts. Move on to Michael, Kat, and Erica going out drinking and getting blasted. Erica and Michael get so wasted that they stop recognizing Kat and just start singing together and making noises together. Kat has to carry them back to the car with the help of a stranger. They both vomit all over everything, each other, the inside of the car, and Kat spends the night at her parents' house with these guys, and the parents help clean them up and make sure that, you know, they don't get any worse. We're also here not going to talk about anything to do with Erica and her involvement with Artie and how it influenced Artie and why Erica is drinking so much as she is. Like, we're not talking about any of this stuff. It's just, it's just there. <laughs> they don't go to prom. They have sex instead and are, are told to write Artie nice letters in the hospital. They celebrate mom's 40th birthday party where she is given a bikini. And of course, Jamie makes all of the cakes and it's better than anything the bakeries could have made. Mom puts on the bikini and asks if she's getting flabby while pinching her skin. And Kat's like, I can show you some exercises to help you with that. <laughs> You're both 109 pounds, please. Then it's the middle of the night, and Erica calls to tell Kat that Sybil is having the baby. The two visit the hospital. The baby is two weeks early. She says that the TV shows show screaming and birth and that it is all BS because you just, like, literally push, and it's over, and it's, like, nothing. However, this is when she says she's going to get an IUD because she is not giving up sex. She refuses, but uh, the next time she wants to give birth, she wants to be able to keep it. The dialogue is insanely unnatural. She says the adopted parents are coming later this week, and it wouldn't have been fair if she kept the baby. Doesn't really further elaborate, so you can only assume that it means it would be unfair for her to change her mind to keep the baby now that it's born. Then she is randomly asking if Kat is sleeping with Michael, and then affirms that she had a baby for the experience, and Erica tells her that she should have had an abortion. Which, you know, is psychotic behavior. You don't go to somebody when they're in the maternity ward after giving birth and been like, you should have aborted it. You don't do it unless you are a psycho. Michael's school graduates. There's a party at Michael's house. Kat's not happy that Michael's parents introduce her as Mike's little friend, and she talks to Mike's dad, but it doesn't really matter. The uncle asks her what she wants to do with her life, and she says she just wants to make people happy. He says that's not enough. She walks away from that conversation. They go back to Kat's house, strip, lay on the lion skin rug naked for old time's sake, holding each other, and talk and then have sex. Quote, I straddle him, helping Ralph find the right angle, and when he was inside of me, I moved slowly up and down, around, up, down, around, until I couldn't control myself anymore. Oh, God. Oh, Michael. Now, now. And then I came. I came before he did. But I kept moving until he groaned as he finished. And I came again, not caring about anything, anything but how good it felt. Happy graduation. I laughed after we lay in each other's arms and thought. And there were so many ways to love a person. This is how it would be forever. Then it's time for Kat's graduation. But Michael can't come because it's indoors and you can only get two tickets to invite people so her parents come while grandparents and little sister and Michael all wait for them to come home for the party. Erica, Michael, and Kat go to a beach house together, go to Erica's beach house together. Artie was initially supposed to come but obviously can't because he's institutionalized. They all meet some random kids, watch surfers in the water. Michael and Kat have sex on a beach after everyone is in bed and then she goes off to camp with Jamie. Then there is a series of letters that go back and forth with a vibe like this. Dear Michael, here I am at camp. The bus ride was up. The bus ride up was bad news. The air conditioning was broke after an hour and we sweltered the rest of the way. One kid heaved in an aisle so that we had to stop and let everyone out while the staff cleaned up the mess and I am considered staff. There are 75 campers, all between the ages of 12 and 15, and every one of them is talented in music and art or both. Like Jamie, tennis is the only organized sport here besides waterfront. The head tennis counselor is called Theo, and he told me right off that I would be teaching the kids with less ability. The girls live in a big old house, and the boys live in a sleeping dorm, a converted barn, and the 15 staff members are all scattered around. My room is in the house, and my roommate is from Seattle. She's a weaving 
shaving expert. Her name is Angela, and she doesn't believe in shaving any body hairs and thinks natural body smells be deodorant. Don't ask. As soon as we got here, Foxy, the director, called a staff meeting and gave us a big lecture about drugs, which are prohibited. As far as I can tell, she's that's the only rule. To tell the truth, I don't know what I'm doing here. I wish that I was with you. Only 49 days until we can be together again. I hope that I live that long. Love forever. Kath. Michael says that he has plenty of deodorant in response and wishes that he was the roommate for Kath. Kat misses Mike and is impressed that all of the... Cat misses Mike and is impressed that by all of the kids and also tells Mike not to talk to other girls on the plane as he goes to his new job. Jamie gets a new boyfriend uh, at the camp and tries to put an em- that tries to put an emphasis on how the camp is for friendships, not sex. Cat's like, don't worry though. Jamie's new flame is more interested in music than her. <laughs> There's a random letter from Mike that says that he is waiting on the plane that he's scared of women, so don't worry about him talking to other ladies. Oops, he's got to go. And it was more like he was on the phone than writing a letter like he could have just written a letter while he was on the plane and it wouldn't have been this sentence of oops i'm busy cat continues to pressure erica to just have sex already where previously it was erica saying uh, i'm just gonna have sex and get it over with but now cat is like freaking just do it quote Dear Erica, when you get this, you'll be back from the beach, and I hope that you had a good weekend. I wish that you would find a nice guy and get Artie off your mind. You can't go on blaming yourself forever. Remember your vow to get laid before college? Well, I've been thinking about that, and I've decided that it might be just what you need. And you know I wouldn't say that if it didn't really mean it. Just let her decide. It is none of your freaking business, cat. She also weirdly complains about the 15-year-old and how, quote, times have certainly changed since we were that age three years ago. The author's old woman is coming out. Erica writes back saying she wants to sleep with someone special now, not just because, so she's going to wait. Also, Sybil seems to be taking it harder that uh, she doesn't have the baby anymore and is getting very depressed. She's being impressed with this one guy, Theo, at summer camp, who is super patient with the other kids and is also not a complete jerk like she thought he was going to be. He tossed her in a lake when she was fully clothed, and they kind of are messing around with each other. He asks her about her necklace, and Catherine says that it says Catherine, Michael, and Forever. He then asks what Forever means and tells her that she should not tie herself down because she is so young and who knows if that is going to be her only love. And she thinks about how she is falling for Theo, spending so much time around him and the summer friends, and that she was having sex dreams initially about Michael, but now she's dreaming of having sex with Theo. She admires him a lot and finds her feelings deepening very quickly. She dances with Theo at a, at a camp event and then runs out of the place crying and thinking, quote, how can you love one person and still be attracted to another? The next day, I got a long letter from Michael and kissed it and showed it to Nan to prove that I am not the least bit interested in anyone but him. It's so stupid. It's building this thing that doesn't really matter, spe- speeding through this relationship with no weight that it doesn't that it doesn't even matter. She just keeps looking at it and showing off that letter and the things that Michael has given her to prove that she has no interest in other people while also just thinking of Theo. Every time she shows somebody something from Michael, she's like, freaking Theo. Now, randomly, she gets a call from her family telling Kat that Grandpa has had a stroke and has died. They, she's like, I want to come home now. I need to come home. I'm so devastated. They're like, no, he died two hours ago you're not coming home stay freaking there now they i don't know one why you would call her on her vacation to tell her this so that she has to grieve by herself and then two we also find out that they didn't call her little sister into the office to inform her little sister so then cat has to go out and tell little sister who also cries but then little sister is said to have quote taken it better than her because she doesn't demand to go home i don't understand this choice at all it doesn't make any difference and why would parents tell their kids that your grandpa died and then be like, no, now you just get to stay there for like however many weeks it is and grieve by yourself. It's so dumb. No thought was put into it. It's just, it felt like another thing to throw in there to prolong the story because the author needed something else to happen in the story, but didn't know what to do. So here's another random thing that does nothing. She's then outside mourning when Theo joins her and is preying on her grief. That is the one thing that comes from mentioning grandpa. Quote, I told him, I'd rather not talk about it. You have to, Cat. 
I shook my head. You need to be close to someone, he said, and I happen to be handy. He kicked at the ground with his foot. Sex is an antidote to death. Did you know that? No. Psychology, too. It is a very common reaction. Somebody dies and you need to prove that you're alive. And what, what, what better way is there? So he sees this grieving girl, knows that she's lost somebody, and is like, you know, the best way to cure your, your depression is with sex. Fuck me. I am a great token, a great totem for your anti-grief situation sleazy. But let's not, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to address that at all. Michael writes her a letter trying to comfort her about her dead grandparents. She writes a letter back saying that she's having feelings for another person, but instead of sending it to him, she rips it up and says that she will never tell Michael about that. All that I'm getting from this is that Kat has no self-control, no personality to the point that when she is separated from the boy that she says she is in love with forever, she has to find another boy to impose herself onto. Still at camp, Cat then has a visitor. When I get there, Foxy looked up from her desk and said, Hi, Cat, you've got a visitor. He pointed to the bathroom, but before I could ask any questions, the door opened and there was Michael. Theo and I were standing side by side, both of us dressed in cut-off shorts, him with no shirt on, me in a halter, covered in sweat, smudged in dirt, and still holding hands, which we dropped immediately. So she knows she's doing something wrong. Kat takes a shower, gets dressed, goes to dinner with Michael, and he brings her back to the hotel that he is staying in and uh, starts to lead them into having sex. Don't worry. This is all skipped over because it gets right to the sex where it's just a, where that's the, where it's at, considering that's the only thing that defines this relationship. She slips out of her clothing, though, and she stops, and she's not doing anything. She slips out of her clothing, though she's not really responding to the way that he is being. He asks her if there is another guy, and she says that she didn't sleep with him, but there sort of is another guy she has feelings for. Yeah. He gets up, goes to the bathroom, gives himself a moment to calm down, and then comes out saying, I'm not about to share you, he said, sounding very calm. I want... I want it the way that it was before, so make up your mind. I swallow hard. I can't make my any promises. Not now. That's what I thought. Are you saying it's over then? You said it. Just now. Couldn't we just sit on it a little while and see what happens? You can't have it both ways. Then it really is over, isn't it? Suddenly, question number four popped into my mind. Have you thought about how this relationship will end? I guess so, he said. I took off my necklace and held it out to him. My throat was too tight to talk. Keep it, he told me. I don't think I should. Our fingers touch as I handed it to him. What am I supposed to do with a necklace that says Catherine? I don't know. He picked up my pocketbook and dropped the necklace into it. Neither of us said anything on the drive back to camp. When we got there, I opened my car door and stepped out, and as I did, he leaned over and said, You might as well know. I screwed my way around North Carolina. I shook my head to show I didn't believe him. He, so he shouted, I humped everything in sight. Liar! I shouted back. You're just trying to say that to hurt me. You'll never know, though. Will you? He took off as fast as the tires shrieked and left marks in the road. So this scene is so stupid. He obviously wanted to keep her, and she is the one that ended the relationship by telling him that she would put him on the back burner and they should just wait. She's got a man on standby, and she just wants to wait to see what happens, but was already holding that dude's hand, standing around shirtless and in a, uh, in a, in a tube top, a halter top. Uh, and she's going to tell him to stand around when he flew all the way here from North Carolina to see her. She is selfish, beyond selfish. But also, I don't know what good there is supposed to be in this stupid character. The last chapter, she goes home, sees Mike one more time at a store and thinks, quote, I wanted to tell him that I will never be sorry for loving him, that in a way I still do, that maybe I always will. I'll never regret one single thing that we did together because what we had was very special. Maybe if we were ten years older, it would have worked out differently. Maybe. I think it's just that I'm not ready forever. She was the one saying forever for forever forever which is so stupid this book probably should have been at least 30 percent longer to actually develop the relationships and the complexities between these relationships if not more than that because you got a lot going on with erica and Artie. you got a lot going on with this you need to develop the relationship with theo to show why she broke away from michael as quickly as she did other than her identity is entirely tied behind who she is fucking but there is also no difference between this and michael and tommy 
but she broke up with Tommy for being sex obsessed. So I don't freaking know what's going on here. Then you've got her going home to Jamie and David pruning mom's birthday tree. So we should also notice that where Jamie had a boyfriend at summer camp and then came back to her other boyfriend, David, probably didn't tell him about her other boyfriend. I guess infidelity just lives in this world. Dad is probably cheating on mom. Mom is probably cheating on dad and they're just pretending to be happy. So whatever. And then she is told that Theo called because obviously she's moved on to Theo since coming back from summer camp. And um, that's the end. That's the book. So yeah. Now let's get into the final comments of this thing. Do you think that there is a point when a book was created for a purpose and it no longer serves that purpose and is no longer needed in the same capacity where I could see that this would possibly be written to fight against certain social norms of the 1970s and even the 1960s because it followed the free love movement so it was obviously perpetuating the free love stuff considering Judy Bloom was 37 so she was 20 during the 60s um so maybe she felt like she needed to perpetuate more of this into normalcy. But American life is not like the 70s anymore. Uh, so if this was to inform, based on the societal situation of the 70s, is there a point when a book no longer serves that purpose because society has changed? Now, the beginning of the book... There is an author's note for the purpose behind this book, and I'm going to read it to you, and then you can think about what was in this book and if the author accomplished that goal. Quote, This book was first published in 1975. My daughter Randy asked for a story about two nice kids who have sex without either of them having to die. She had read several novels about teenagers in love, and if they had sex, the girl was always punished. An unplanned pregnancy, a hasty trip to a relative in another state, a grisly abortion, illegal in the U.S. until the 1970s, Sometimes even death, lies, secrets, at least one life ruined. Girls in these books had no sexual feelings and boys had no feelings other than sexual. Neither took responsibility for their actions and I wanted to present another kind of story. One in which two seniors in high school fall in love, decide together to have sex and act responsibly. The 70s were a time when sexual responsibility meant preventing unwanted pregnancies. Today, sexual re responsibility also means preventing sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV and AIDS. In this book, Catherine visits a clinic and is given a prescription for the pill. Today, she would be told it is essential to use a condom along with any other method of birth control. If you're going to become sexually active, then you have to take responsibility for your own actions. So get the facts first. Number one. This, this blurb itself says that pregnancy is a punishment to having sex. No, it is a natural, it is a natural consequence to what is procreation. Now, you don't always have to have sex to have a child, but sex is the act that creates a child. So pregnancy is not a punishment for having sex. And it is such a twisted mindset to position pregnancy as punishment. It is a natural consequence. Like, you do stupid shit, you get a natural consequence. Stupid shit like flying, like a uh, uh, dangerous stunts. Like, if you do stuff like in Jackass, the natural consequence is you're going to get hurt. So it is insane to me that this positions pregnancy as a punishment. And that mindset is toxic. You may not want a pregnancy, but it is not a punishment. And it is insane to say so. It also states that it wanted to show teenagers having sex with nothing bad happening, them choosing to have sex, and a guy having more than, than just the desire to have sex. Where is Michael's desire to have more than sex? Where is Theo's desire in this to have more than just sex? Because Theo is making moves on her immediately. Michael is coercing her constantly. Erica is coercing Artie constantly. So where is this anything? is they feel like they have to perform one way or another, and they have to perform for each other constantly. This also assumes that if you have a pregnancy, or positions that if you have a pregnancy, if you get a child, it ruins your life instead of just opening a different door. This also stated that they wanted to write a book, the author wanted to write a book about two good kids having sex. I would not describe Kat or Michael as good kids. Kat is obviously an underachiever. She has no personality. She has no interest. She has no sense of responsibility. She has nothing. She lies to her parents all of the time. She is jealous of her sister. She is jealous of Erica. She is jealous of Sybil. She sneaks around. What is good about her? And then Michael is coercive all the time. The only thing he has going for him is that he is actually, he is actually loyal to her until she says, hey, it's over. I'm, I'm dreaming of another guy. 
So like, how does this story represent whatever it is Judy Bloom is talking about in this thing? Another thing that really bothers me specifically, and it's how I define erotica, is the climax is the climax. It doesn't matter if there's only one sex scene in the entire book. If the entire thing is laced with it's just about sex, it reads like erotica. The characters are obsessed with sex, the outcome and desire, the motivation is to have sex, and that's how this reads. It reads like fetishize, fetishizing the sexuality of teenagers. And then it feels like an adult woman coercing teenagers that you have to have sex because you can't not have sex. And you see it in the way that Catherine's mother talks to Catherine and says, well, once you have sex, you can't go back. So it's coercive. And look, everybody is having sex. You're going to have sex. The grandmother is like, you're going to have sex. You're glowing if you have sex. Everybody knows if you're a virgin. You should be ashamed if you're a virgin. Are you ashamed of showing your body by not showing your bra to the, by not taking off your bra in front of this guy? All of it is shaming somebody for choosing the decision not to and then telling you that you have no choice but to have sex. That is the only choice. And it's weird to me. But tell me, what would you call the genre that is written for the sole purpose of showing teenagers having sex to teenagers to show them teenagers having sex? Like, what would you call that genre? Obviously, one of the biggest issues I had with this book is there was no plot, no motivation, no character, no anything. Kat is your is the character you're supposed to follow, but she doesn't want for anything. Erica, Jamie have more personality. Even heck, Michael has more personality and actually gets himself a summer job like he says he's going to. What does Kat do? Nothing. The book ultimately just feels like a vehicle for the author to talk to the reader, the receptacle of whatever information she thinks that you should be hit over the head with, whether you agree with it or not. There's no actual story. And so it's a waste of space on a bookshelf to me. The book should be burned, okay? Joking, not joking. <laughs> based on the conversation. It's a joke, okay? It really is a joke. But in all seriousness, this book is an insult to Ralph's everywhere uh, for the fact that it misuses that name. That is actually why it should be burned. If you want to read a book with a much better Ralph Freed, Body More Zero, he is a sweetheart. This is Ian after the fact. And as I was going through the editing of the video, I came up with two other things. I, I thought about two other things that I want to mention as are relevant to this book and to the topics that surround this book and the way that this book presents information. Number one is the naming of Michael's penis. Now, if you have to name your penis in order to deliver it in a a less frightening way and just for the just so you know the only time he said that he named it was when he was talking to cat and he said i named it for you and then dropped it so he didn't even say it was to not scare her but you can see in the commentary around this book that it was named so that the penis was less scary and i can only assume less scary than to the audience if you have to rename if you have to name a penis in order to make it kind of like a puppet and the act of sex into a puppet show you know, you're turning the the dance between the sheets into Sesame Street, your audience is probably too young, okay? If you have to give your dick a name, then the audience is too young for sex. So I don't understand why that is, unless you're naming it for the gag of laughing. But if you're naming it to try to make the penis seem less scary, then your target audience is too young to discuss sex like this to be exposed or encouraged to sex like this. This isn't sex education, this is grooming. Number two, um, the identification of asexual and sexual mixed with coercion. Now I'm not saying anything about all people that have any label of asexual to them. What I have noticed in some of my conversations and I've also been the subject of in conversation is that if you are not actively encouraging or coercing and being a part of sexual behavior, you are considered antisocial, you're considered anti-person, you're considered repressed, and you are just insulted. The only way to get around this sexual coercion is to say that you are asexual and then your choices to not partake in promiscuous sex sex are valid. However, if you choose to not have promiscuous sex or be a super sexual person for any other reason beyond asexual, you get insulted. And you can see an example of this in a long conversation on my book review here for Silly Boy. There is a person in there who argues for a very long time that if you say no to sex, then you should be bullied because that is anti-sexual behavior. And somebody came in and said that they were asexual. And he's like, that's valid. But any other reason to say no to sex is not valid. And so there is an active campaign. And I'm not, again, saying all people that that identify as asexual are related to this issue. But I have seen the pro-sex crowd who are not just um, 
who are not just sexually open, who are not just encouraging, but are actually coercive to the point that if you choose any other decision beyond it being your sexual orientation identity, they come after you. And that is something that I don't think I have seen discussed yet. And it's also kind of a kind of a sketchy subject because you know that people are going to take even that statement itself as something personal. Heck, I didn't even think that it would be controversial to say, why do people, why are people unable apparently to write relationships that are not sexual? They have to slash all of them. Oh, your brother and sister? Well, slash, now you're sexual. Oh, your friends? Slash, now you're sexual. And that turned into a into a controversial take where the person who initially, you know, the person who I mentioned in the Silly Boy video um, went on to say that making statements like that or asking questions like that is anti-LGBT because apparently you can't talk about friendships, period, uh, or else it is anti-gay. So again, it is a very weird subject in general, but how pervasive the coercion is and also, oh my gosh, I'm still reading the Nutcracker book. I haven't really cracked it open <laughs> in a couple of days but you have a person in there one of the main characters and this is supposed to be her sexual flirting i assume it is it sees the nutcracker as sexually repressed because Louisa is very, very hot. It lets you know that she is very hot and she sleeps with a lot of people. And so then he is like not jumping into bed with her and she drops her towel to show him because she's like, I'm so hot. How can you tell me no? And he still doesn't jump her bones and it immediately jumps to her going, wait, are you impotent? And so then later in a broom closet, when he is weakening, going back into the curse of becoming a wooden doll, she shoves her hands down his pants and starts stroking him and coercing him and molesting him against his will after he's already said don't do this and when he says stop her internal monologue says i don't know if he means it so we've got these sexually coercive people that don't accept stop that don't back off when someone says back off and that bully you just like michael did in this just like erica did in this if you do not put out and it is a subject that is not getting talked about enough because you have the obviously the pro-social crowd that is one side. And then they assume that if you're not a pro-social person, then you are some kind of Puritan repressed whatever when it's how about just leave me alone? How about just not pushing boundaries? How about not putting people into such a defensive place that they feel like if they don't want to have sex that they have to say they're asexual because you are pushing it so hard and that's the only way to get you to shut up? Obviously, I'm heated on this, but uh, so let me know what your thoughts are on that. Again, not all, but it is something that I have recognized that I have personally been a victim of. So if you want to um, tell me that doesn't happen, it has happened. It's happened to me, though. I never I never go into saying asexual because I don't believe in having to defend yourself like that. So with that said. That's the, that's the end of my note. Final note, I would like to go back to all of the conversations I've ever had uh, that said Trad Pub used to be better and then it tanked in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, check note, ch checkmate atheists. This was published 50 years ago. I think Trad Pub just lives on the name and and the reputation, historical reputation. There are great books that come through trad. There's a lot of garbage that also comes through trad in the same way that there's a lot of garbage that comes through indie, but people don't really separate the different the different levels of content that come through indie and they don't separate the different levels of content that come through trad they just remember all of the big things that come through trad and remember trad also gave you fourth wing and colleen hoover so i mean those are popular are they well written no but it doesn't really matter what's well written or not it's popular if it's enjoyed by the masses just remember haunting adeline is also popular with that said, let me know what you think down in the comments below. That is Forever by Judy Bloom. My final diagnosis is toss it into the fire. But what's yours? Let me know. With that said, have a great weekend and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it. But as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. 
I'm not talking to the badges. I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk. Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right? <laughs>